everyone, and those of you that are tuning in to this portion of our board meeting. This is a work session, a dinner session, which is why some of us don't have masks on right now because we're in the uh, we're we're dining as we work today. Um, the purpose of this session really is just for us to have some informal conversation with each other, uh, possibly with policies that are coming up and or policies that are on our agenda tonight is our, is our topic for tonight. Um, and there we go. I see we have remotely, we have legal counsel Mary Clemish as well as um, Director uh, Hansen. And then we all are here with the exception of Director Chancho Shore who will be absent today. So to, again, tonight's topic really is for us to um, consider and look at some revisions not only from those policies that are authorized the superintendent to um, um, promote, but also some, some policies we may want to think about as we're moving forward with some of these unique times in terms of the impact of COVID on our schools. So with that, um, Mrs. Clemish, I'm gonna let you have the introductory remarks so I can grab a bite to eat. Um, if you'll give us an overview of some of the things you've been working on, and we're truly grateful for, for all the, the, the work that you have done in terms of helping us uh, continue to guide by policy. So I'll turn that over to you. All right, Thank, thanks Director Ray, and good evening uh, directors. And thanks for, um, your time and energy in reviewing these policies and providing comments. Um, with respect to that, I think that uh, David has really nicely articulated what we're going to be focusing on this evening. One is looking at policies, not only proposed board policies, which the board will consider this evening, but also to review with the board those policies that already have been addressed by cabinet and the superintendent with respect to implementing policies and legal requirements um, related to both Title IX and then some of the regulatory mandates which have resulted from the implementation of Title IX regulations effective on August the 14th. So with respect to that, I'll begin, and I'm happy to be interrupted by any questions that board members may have. This is informal um, members of cabinet as well, if there's any questions that they can answer in support of these revisions in this discussion, um, we'll be happy to take those questions and engage in a discussion. First of all, last at the last board meeting, we're gonna discuss policies related to COVID-19 that have are being policy revisions that are being considered by the board as a result of uh, COVID-19. And the first one that we considered at the last board meeting, and tonight will be the second board reading of the board, is IC, uh, ICA related to school year, school calendar and instructional time. And at our last uh, board meeting, Matt Reynolds uh, very thoroughly described the reason for this policy, which is essentially, and the development of this policy to identify and define not only for this upcoming year, but moving forward, what does active engagement in the educational process mean for purposes of getting and acquiring the appropriate um, recognition from the State Board of Education for time spent by students, not only in in-person instruction, but e-learning instruction as well. So there have been no further revisions uh, between the first and second reading to this particular policy, which will be proposed for consideration of the board for a second reading this evening. So I think either Matt or I would be happy to answer any questions you may have if any board member has a question related to a board file IC or ICA at this time. Directors, any questions regarding? Okay. Looks good, Mary. Let's move on. Okay. The next policy that we are going to be addressing this evening relates to uh, workplace health and safety protection. This was a policy that was recommended by CASB, and it also is consistent with the recent passage of a Colorado state law entitled Workers' Rights Related to a Public Health Emergency. So this law was passed and essentially prohibits discrimination against an employee 
um, or retaliation who raises reasonable concerns about workplace violations of government health or safety rules. This policy has been drafted uh, for the board. It's a first reading of the board this evening. It is not a policy it, which is required by the board to pass under specific state law, but um, certainly is within the board's purview to pass under your governance structure. Um, related to this, um, a couple of, of notes. First, this policy um, recognizes the appointment of a workplace coordinator. This is consistent with existing public health orders which have um, and recognize that workplace coordinators will be appointed by employers to assist with assuring compliance with applicable state public health orders for employees in the workplace. Additionally, there will be notice posters which will be posted in each of our school buildings that will be issued through the Colorado Department of Labor and those posters will go with the rest of the posters that will advise our employees of their rights related to this policy. So um, we're prepared and implementing the requirements of this state law at this point in time. Uh, the enactment of this as policy is uh, very consistent with the regular, excuse me, the legal requirements of this new Colorado law. Very good. Are there any questions that I can answer related to this proposed policy. Directors, any questions? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, you know, we'll comment uh, when we're in our regular session, but I think, uh, Mary, this is really a, a reassurance to our staff, too, to really see that uh, there's no retaliation for reporting concerns about the workplace, and, and really having that in writing, I think, is a real reassurance to our staff that we, along with them, want their workplace to be as safe as possible. So uh, this, this looks good, thank you. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So uh, then, I'm sorry, Mary. Hang on. Anthony had a question. Yeah. Was, sure. <clears throat> just regarding um, the section where it mentions um, his or her own protective equipment, mm -hmm. are those are the items that you're listing there? Is it limited to those, or, or does this give people in the building the ability to go beyond that and wear? much more detailed equipment or like scrubs, for example, are we granting that kind of act, uh, that saying that's okay? You know, certainly I don't think this is a restrictive list. I think the language in the policy is, includes the language such as, so it's descriptive in response to your question. And additionally, um, we have been actively engaged, I think as you've been apprised from uh, Amanda Thompson, our director of human resources, uh, or chief human resources officer, that we are accommodating our employees uh, with respect to assuring that they feel safe and accommodated in the workplace. Okay. Does, does that respond to your question, Anthony? Uh, it does, thanks. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna move on then to the Mary, next- Hang on, uh, Mary, hang on just one more second. It looks like uh, Susan has a question. Okay, Mary, thank you. Um, I'm just curious, once this is adopted, what is the process of it being rolled out so that everyone is aware of the policy? And can you confirm that this does apply to charter schools as well? Well, um, I hadn't really thought about the charter school question, but certainly uh, charter schools would be obligated to comply with state law to the extent it's applicable to them. And I see no reason why it is not, although I haven't specifically addressed that particular requirement of the law, but it applies to all employers in the state of Colorado. So essentially this policy is a recitation of the, or concise, succinct recitation of the state's legal requirements. In that regard, uh, all of our employers in the state of Colorado will be following uh, a policy or a process similar to this. We will be rolling out the policy essentially by providing notice or posters similar to the other posters we post in our uh, common areas in the school building. We also will be developing a system for advising our um, employees through principal notes, in starting with our principals to share with their employees 
regarding who is the workplace coordinator, who you, can you take your concerns to, et cetera. And so we are in the process of rolling those things out to our schools. It's my understanding that our posters will be up in each of our schools uh, sometime next week or soon thereafter. Very good. All right. Now you can move on, Mary. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I, I misspoke. Dr. Tucker, go ahead. Dr. Tucker, I think you might need to use that portable mic. In addition to the policy and the guidance in the policy, we sent out a couple weeks ago a statement to staff encouraging staff to obviously uh, follow the guidelines that are stipulated by our county and state health uh, departments but also encourage others to follow the guidelines and feel free that they can uh, articulate their concerns to their principals or to the district office without any retribution. That has already been communicated to staff. Very good. All right. Okay, Mary, I think we'll, we'll try it again. I think we can move on to the next. Okay, I'm gonna to try to go quickly because we have lots of things to get through. The next one is student conduct on school buses. And this is a board policy and this policy, um, we felt the need to revise because there was not a specific provision in this policy generally um, recognizing that disciplinary action and or loss of bus riding privileges could be imposed uh, for failure to follow with school rules related to safety and conduct. So we included that as an addition to this policy along with a specific provision which states that students must comply with all policies, rules, regulations, and instruction of the district implemented to reduce the risk of transmission of communicable diseases, including COVID-19, including a requirement that students wear face coverings unless the student cannot medically tolerate a face covering and a requirement regarding social distancing. So the goal is to put uh, our families on notice who utilize our bus transportation system that riding privileges can be suspended if the safety rules are not uh, complied with. Very good. Questions, directors? Nope. We can move on, Mary. Okay. The next policy oh, sorry. revision. Whoops. Oh, I, you know, I'm not giving enough wait time, obviously. I need to slow down. <laughs> Director Lung, De Kevin, what do you have? Hey, Mary, I just want to know um, if a person violating this policy is there we cause, um, and um, if they're being suspended of the PFH, how soon can they can they apply to get it back um, the PFH to ride a bus? Is this something? So uh, is, I may defer to uh, Ted to respond to that question, but clearly there is discretion given to the administration to implement these rules consistent with practices that make sense to a particular situation. If bus riding privileges are suspended, I think uh, it's, it should be clear that it doesn't eliminate the ability of the student to attend school for the day. The length of the suspension of the bus riding privileges would be determined by the administration. And clearly um, my understanding is that there would be an expectation under this policy that a student's bus driving privileges could not be reinstated unless there was a commitment to complying with the applicable safety uh, rules and the other rules of conduct. Ted, is there anything else that should be added uh, in response to Kevin's question? No, Ted's, Ted's shaking his head. I think, I think you covered that so well. Can I, can I follow up of, of that? So, so for example, just have a fairly speaking, okay? If somebody was caught um, having drugs or uh, alcohol or something like that on the bus, so that is only affecting the bus PFH. It does not affecting for them to go to school for that day to continue the schooling. Or a day or whatever happened in the bus also considered a violations as of you know they're on the school ground also. You know, clearly these are discretionary decisions made by our administration consistent with the rules and the authority the administrators have. Violation of a code of conduct related to possession of drugs on a school bus 
is a serious infraction or depending upon the nature of the reason why they might have them. Are they there for the purpose of selling or distributing drugs? Clearly a serious infraction that would be subject to discipline consistent with the rules of conduct that the district has. As you know, because recently the district has um, revised its policy JK related to um, student discipline, which looks at restorative justice and the means of not just being punitive with respect to its responses to student discipline, but to use it as an instructional tool to assist students in understanding the reasons for complying with codes of conduct rules. So as I think Ted um, is going to discuss later with respect to generally looking at standards of conduct and the general rules of conduct and how they apply to our students with respect to looking at enforcement of our school safety rules, including things like wearing a mask or keeping slow social distancing. Application of those general discipline policies will afford our principals general discretion to enforce them using an instructional means through our model of restorative justice to try to uh, encourage students to understand the reasons for these policies without being punitive. For example, um, without prohibiting a student from attending school for lengthy periods of time, unless that makes sense to the particular set of circumstances. Ted, am I articulating that appropriate to your understanding of uh, the school administration's means of addressing safety uh, conduct rules? Yes, Director Long, I'd probably just answer directly your example of drugs. That would most likely be considered behavior on or off school property that's detrimental to the school. So my guess is a majority of our principals would also have in-school consequences for that. I was using that as an example, but my general question is, if somebody violating the rules in the bus, is the bus an extension of the school ground? That yes. means that that would be automatically notified to the principal, and the principal would take whatever the violations that they have in the bus as of they are also doing that in the school ground, that would take action accordingly. That, that is my a general question. I, I don't mean to ask the particular things about you know, drugs or things like that. So, so, so that's my question. The answer is so, yes. Very good. So Mary, okay. I wonder if you Thanks. want to jump over to the EEAA. Since we're talking about transportation, that one is the transportation for eligible students. So just keeping with our bus theme, is that, should we just jump over there sure. for a second? That's great. This, this policy needed to be revised in order to allow for the district to um, address particular circumstances that were extenuating to allow them to limit uh, the availability of buses or seats available to transport students in circumstances like the one we're presently facing. And in this instance, the policy has been revised so that when extenuating circumstances exist, which limit the availability of bus seats or buses, that the school district will make and provide transportation to the extent it is available to students with the goal of providing uh, services to those elementary school students who live more than two and a half miles from school and for secondary school students who live more than five miles from school. So, well, presently in, in, in the area that I represent, um, so there was a policy that say, you know, no bus is in a gated community. And that was not being enforced before. And is this policy, how would that, how would that affecting, you know, the student from from this point onwards um, for people who live in the gated community? I think that the, um, and again, I'll defer to Rich Cosgrove, who's most familiar with setting up the bus routes and looking at this particular issue, but gated communities are on private property. 
And so when you look at designating distances, I think you're looking at distances to the public property that is most accessible to the entrance to that private property. Uh, for example, you might have um, somebody living in a rural part of Colorado in our district who might have a um, driveway that could be three miles long or something like that. So Rich, is there anything that you might add in response to Kevin's question? Rich is coming on down. Director Long, thank you for the question. Under the current constraints of COVID-19, the reason that we are picking up at or in the close proximity to the gates is simply because of the resources. We have um, 201 drivers. We have um, 100 general education routes and 75 special education routes, and that's all that we can provide. And so besides the designation of private roads, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, it would require significantly more buses to go actually into gated communities. It takes a while to go through the gate. It's not always consistent. Um, notwithstanding specific uh, HOAs, some private roads, many, do not have curb and gutter. They would require students to stand in the street. Uh, they're hard to turn around. Some gated communities uh, are not lit. Um, so it's not a public right of way, and uh, that's the reason for the general policy. But the overarching reason now is simply because of a resource issue. So, so my concern is, um, I know that initially this policy was used because before our county only have very few people, and whenever you have a gated community and there's long dirt roads and it's kind of hard for the bus to travel and things like that, but now we have close to 50,000 residents in our community. And I do, I mean, our county, I don't know whether that need to be make it much more clear because for example, in Highlands Ranch, Long Tree, Castle Pine Village, we have a large number of people that live inside the gated community. Um, and, 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 and the role were really well maintained that, and even though they may be private role, but they're actually funded by um, then the government entity. So I, I, I'm just don't know whether we need to make this definition a little bit more clear because my understanding is that initially this was used so that we don't travel long distance to a rural road for a long distance to pick up one or two students. Um, but as gated community become more permanent in a um, uh, more dense populated area, I, I'm just a little bit uneasy about um, some of the work thing in, in that. So Kevin, I know Krista had uh, some comments too, and so I'll let her jump in. This is a discussion board director, so um, jump in if you want. Go ahead, Krista. Um, yeah, so I totally um, understand what you're saying, Kevin, Director Long, um, since we're at a work session and more casual. Um, I guess when I think about safety concerns, I really have greater concern for students who live um, on busy, busy thoroughfares. Um, I can think of a couple of schools in Parker, for instance, Pine Lane and Sierra Middle School, where um, most of our students have to walk long distances and they're not within a gated community where traffic tends to be more um, monitored and slower and cautious. So I guess my question really is, um, I see that there are abilities to make exceptions for dangerous conditions um, as determined by the superintendent or his designee. But I also know that our recent budget cuts have really, really made it difficult um, for us to provide transportation, not to mention um, the restrictions for public health. So I guess I have two questions. Um, what would be the process if a family really felt like it, they had dangerous conditions for their students that needed to walk? And what would be that process for them to try to apply for extreme hardship exception? Um, and then knowing that we really are limited on our transportation, have we or could we talk with the foundation about even trying to connect families with community resources that could help us out getting students to school? 
or um, I don't know. I'm just, I, I like Director Long. I'm really concerned about some of our students who are walking those long distances. They have no options and they're on really busy roads. So just looking for a couple of um, thoughts on those. And I just want to add that um, I understand, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people understand COVID 19, we only have one third of the bus capacity and also the budget cut and things like that. But a policy is for long term policy is for you know not just because of this year we have this policy once we pass a policy it will apply even without covid-19 right if my understanding is that so i, I just want to make sure that we, when we have a policy this is exception um, years where all of this coming together that caused this huge problem but does it make sense or do we need to do revisions once covid-19 is gone, or at least we found a, a vaccine for that, that that could make our bus situations a little bit better. So we'll do two parts here. So one, we're going to have Rich is going to address Krista's comments, and then Mary, if you can maybe talk to the longevity of the policy and whether or not this is just for COVID budget related issues. Um, but start with Rich. Go ahead, Mom. Directors, thank you very much. So the policy historically has had provision for the superintendent or his or her designee to um, address particular situations. And in the past, when we were resourced, we would prioritize and transport students that lived across a major arterial road, even if they, in fact, were within the school boundary. Um, and that's always our preference. And that was a very um, tough discussion for the task force. Um, and the, the end result was to be consistent and have a radius and honor the most distant and rural routes, understanding that students would have to walk across roads uh, with signalized crossings. Um, and the responsibility basically is to use the public right of way in the safe manner as it was designed. And that's signalized crossing, crosswalks. But the task force does understand that. And the in the past, as we would love to restore, is we would prioritize those crossings that either, either at a distance or the, the number of lanes of a road and the speed of the road, and if there is a signalized crossing and what distance that is from the school. And so, Rich, is there an appeals process if a parent says, I think you missed something, you missed that this is a four-lane you know, four highway that you're asking my kid to cross? Is, is there an appeals process for that? We do receive and evaluate and respond um, since we've established our current routes on a case-by-case -case basis. Right now, they have been available safe routes, but it's not a convenient route. And I'm just going to follow up in case anybody has information. I know that the foundation is doing a great job of collecting resources and um, and, and maybe I need an update on this, but I know at one time, you know, we were waiting to make sure how we could spend our federal CARES dollars because we didn't want to duplicate. And um, But I just wondered if there was any way, because I think there are some families that are going to have a really tough time, and if there were ways to connect them with community resources for transportation. Yes, Director Holtzman, that's a great question. Ashley from the Foundation and, and myself are working on that. We have been for a few days now, so we can definitely get you some more information on that. We're looking at it using an equity lens. We know we have lots of students who are at risk who, you know, it might be a challenge to get to school, and so she is working with some of her community partners uh, with legal in terms of what rideshare companies we might have available. So we are looking at every, every available opportunity we have to help get some of those kids to school who might otherwise not be able to make it. Thanks, that's great news. So Mary, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the longevity of policy revisions? So the question really is, you know, do we revise policies for, for specifically for pandemic and budget issues um, and then have to revise once again when the pandemic goes away or budget is better? Uh, what's your thoughts about the longevity of these revisions we're making? Whoops, Mary, I think you're on mute, Mary. Nope, still, still can't hear you, Mary. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you go, there you go. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question, Director Ray. We really try when we revise the policies to revise them in a manner so that they 
will have life, that they can live a long time and adapt to the circumstances that may arise in a particular circumstance that is unpredictable uh, at all at, at, a, at the particular time when the policy is adopted. In this instance, this particular policy is adopted and was specifically drafted with these revisions, which is a superintendent policy, to specifically state that this particular provision here really only applies when extenuating circumstances exist. And so clearly as well, we have another policy, policy BG, which addresses policy review, which suggests that in an effort to keep district policies up to date, both the board and the superintendent should review, in fact, the policy says, shall review policies on a continuous basis. So to the extent that this policy or another policy that has been adopted no longer is applicable to the particular set of circumstances, it certainly would be appropriate to revise that policy at that particular time. But you're feeling like there's an intentionality around putting some words in there that makes it broad enough, like extenuating circumstances is certainly something that covers a lot of things or could cover a lot mm -hmm. of things. But it sounds like that there's been some intentionality around looking at that language so it's not us going back and forth given whatever new issue we have to deal with. So that makes, that makes sense. Susan, I know you yes. were jumping in there. So I think resolutions often are used for short term you know, issues. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think the question I have, I know the district used to have policy council. I don't know if that's something that's been discussed in recent years and they would meet regularly, look at policies, make recommendations. It's been discussed almost on an annual basis. Okay. <laughs> and the answer is? We have yet to, we have yet to go there. I think we were, getting, we were getting closer each time, and then um, this little distraction called COVID showed up, and so it kind of threw everything out of whack. But, um, but yes, that's been a desire of this board um, since I've been on it, and that was, that's been five years ago. So um, yes, that's something we would want to pursue, and I know uh, Mary and I have, have discussed that as well. So, um, so yes, once we get to a place where we can actually be proactive as opposed to reactive, I think uh, we definitely look forward to having that kind of a group of people focused on policy. So Mary, I'm thinking is, is for the sake of time, um, I wanna give directors a chance just to jump in and, and discuss maybe some questions they have. I know you've, you've given us some information about some policies that are currently being reviewed uh, given the impact of COVID. And so we certainly see those, but I also wanna give directors just a quick chance to jump in if there's other topics that you're wondering about that needs to be addressed with policy revision and or if there's any of these policies that Mary uh, has worked on for us tonight, if there's any other questions you have. The Title IX policies certainly um, are pretty straightforward and are they align with all the Title IX policies we've been working on the last couple times. So I, I don't know that they need a lot of explanation. But directors, are there other topics that you want to ask? Krista, jump in there. Yeah, thank you, Mary. This has been uh, it's a great, um, I appreciate the memo and all the stuff you've put together for us. My question is really just, I need um, help understanding where this comes from. So when I look at JICCR2 that we're talking about tonight about riding the bus, we inserted some language that says, including a requirement that students wear face coverings while on a bus, unless the student can't ma medically tolerate a face mask, and also a requirement that the student maintain applicable social distancing. <clears throat> so that makes me think, where in our policies are we asking students to do that when they're at school? For instance, is that going to be a part of our student dress code? Um, I know that it seems like JICA, which is the student dress code policy, um, gives principals the ability to establish specific standards for their schools, but I know that um, I've talked with Dr. Tucker before, and I know that he wants this to be consistent throughout our schools. So how are we accomplishing that through our policies? Uh, th thanks for the question, Director Holtzman. We have been you know, carefully, actually, probably for the last 
couple of months looking at our policies to see what needs to be revised, what can be revised with discretion. And the reason that um, I guess we felt or I felt the student conduct on school buses should be revised was because that particular policy did not have at the initiation of the policy any clear directives with respect to the fact that disciplinary action or loss of privileges could be imposed if a student failed to comply with rules of safety and conduct. Um, it said they were expected to observe those rules, but it didn't address a consequence. So that's why that policy was revised in comparison to our other policies. And you are, uh, you've very carefully, it sounds like, reviewed our policies, Director Holtzman, because you have actually identified the, the language in our student dress code, which provides for specific standards that can be applied by our schools, uh, by our administration and our school principals to set standards for schools. It particularly has a specific provision that addresses the fact that dress that causes a disruption to the educational process is prohibited. It also has a very specific provision, which was not included in the bus uh, conduct policy, which stated that the decision as to the safety or unsuitability of attire is a matter for the instructor's or school administrator's judgment. And so I'm gonna ask Ted to talk uh, more about what the school administration is, uh, has planned or how they will be implementing these policies. We also have a student conduct policy at JIC, JICDA, which specifically states uh, in that policy that conduct which disrupts or threatens to disrupt the operation of schools, which interferes in any way with the rights and privileges of other students or citizens, or which endangers the health or safety of any person, uh, will not be tolerated and will result in disciplinary action. So that again, kind of referencing our discussion to policies are broad, authorizing the administration, the discretion to implement the response to specific forms of student conduct, which violate student rules. And then uh, finally, our student discipline policy, which we have just reviewed recently and updated, um, Policy JK, our board file JK, uh, states that effective discipline considers the age and development of the student in framing the instruction and appropriate behavior and the consequences for misbehavior and includes consideration of repair of harm and restoring relationships. So consideration of using restorative justice. So with that, um, we feel that clearly our policies provide the parameters for allowing our administration to utilize uh, their discretion in administering rules of conduct related to safety in schools and compliance with applicable health orders and the plan that the district is implementing for in-person instruction in its schools. Um, Ted, would you embellish on the specific plans that are in place with our administration? Uh, for implementing the codes of conduct related to the safety rules. Sure. Thank you, board. The, the dress code portion of this mask is very similar to any other article of clothing, right? We, the administration has a discretion if, a, if the, the content of a mask is causing a disruption to um, ask the student to replace it with the mask that we would provide. We have masks there. The, the second part, which is the part that I think is, is more common in terms of what folks are worrying about, and that is what happens if a student is not wearing a mask. And in our FAQ and in our plan and through discussions with principals, we've, we've kind of taken a, a three-tiered approach and used more of a restorative uh, versus a, a punishment lens, and that is we want to understand why the kid is not wearing a mask and we want to educate them on the importance of wearing the mask to their safety and the safety of those around them. Um, so it could be as simple as a, a teacher just reminding a student to put your mask back on. Um, I, I would imagine that is going to happen. Um, 
if there's a refusal, uh, an administrator will step in and they can work with the, with the student and figure out why they're refusing. Again, educate and get that student to put their mask back on. Um, in theory, the second time that happens, we would involve the parents and, and again, help educate the parents, um, both the risk to their child and the risk to others. And the third time, um, we, we reserve the right to say, you're gonna have to go to an e-learning format. We, we cannot have you continue to come into the school and in, you know, endanger others. That, of course, is a last resort and not the area that we want to go to. That would probably be deemed more defiance than it would um, non-mask wearing. It would be like any other student who just continues to, to defy a rule um, without reason. But again, the goal would be to educate students. Um, if at any point that student does become defiant, we would move them to the isolation room and that's where this would happen. We wouldn't have the student stay in the classroom and with the mask on and have that conversation. They would be isolated, have the conversation, see if we can get them to put the mask back on and go from there. So Ted, the practices that you just described, are those, are those gonna be published? So, so all our schools are consistent with exactly what you just described? Yeah, those are in our FAQ and they also went out in our mass guidance at some point last week. Okay. Um, I can't remember the exact date, but um, yeah. that's, and again, it's something we've been discussing in meetings for a while, but the actual written guidance just went out last week, but it's been in the FAQ for a while now. Do you think it would be helpful, Mary, and I ask this of you as, as well as Ted, you know, in our parallel policy, GBEBA staff dress code, we have a statement mm -hmm. in there that says, such requirements may include that employees wear prescribed safety equipment or clothing. And I'm just wondering if it would be helpful um, to have in our, in our student dress policy something similar that just says that there may be an expectation that you also have to wear safety uh, clothing or, or something of that nature. Just that there's parallel and it also gives, I think our principals some teeth mm -hmm. to when they say, you know, the, the, the first time this is happening, the second time it's happening, and guess what? Board policy really drives and, and, and says that you principal have permission to, to enforce that. So sure. I'm just, I guess my question is, would that be helpful for us to consider a revision to the student dress that talks about safety equipment or, or safety clothing, if you will, similar to the staff policy? It may be helpful. Um, I think that um, it, I don't believe it is necessary for the administration at this time to enforce the policy. To the extent that the board or the administration believes it would be helpful to uh, assist them in enforcing the safety rules of conduct, it certainly is appropriate to consider as a revision to the policy. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Kev Kevin, I mean, you jumped in and Krista and. Susan, were you? Okay. And I'm also, I'm gonna pause for a second. We haven't heard from Elizabeth. And so Elizabeth, I just wanna make sure you're with us. And Elizabeth Hansen, are you there? I am, oh, I good. have no questions. Oh good, okay. I just wanna make sure we didn't lose you. All right, Kevin, go ahead. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Good. So All Mary, right. you, you put in specific number five in the JICC-R-2 to specifically, um, call out the risk of transmissions of uh, communicable DC, including COVID-19 in there. And, but JICA and uh, JBAB, um, oh, I'm sorry, J -J JICA and JBEBA, the student dress and the staff dress, um, how come that same provisions, you don't think is necessary to be included um, in, you know, in there to specifically mention about the communicable DC. Um, I, I know that Dr. Tucker has repeatedly said that mass is mandatory. Repeat mentioned how important it is. But by not including a similar sections in those two, do the board accidentally send a message that wearing masks on bus is more important than wearing masks on a, on a, on school ground for both teacher and uh, and the student, and that's the reason why I only put that additional in bus, but not on the other two. I think during this pandemic, it's very important that the district send a very clear message to everyone that 
we are serious on cutting down on the transmission, trans, in a commutable disease, and face mask is proven effective to do that. And I am asking you, is that appropriate to include a similar language in both JICA and JBEBA, just for the sake of uh, maintaining um, uniformity across all our policies, since we add one over there, and, and why don't we just add to the other one to make sure that you know that this is a safety and health issues that the district and the board care a lot. So I just want to, before we turn this over to Mary, I just want to interject, board, that these are our policies. So these are under our authorization. Mary's certainly giving us counsel with regards to whether she feels it's a necessity or not. And we've heard that tonight. But certainly, if, if board, if we have board policies that are under our th authorization that we feel need to be revised, that's certainly in our purview to do that. So I want to be careful that we don't put all the pressure on Mary. Uh, she's just giving us counsel and advice from her perspective in terms of whether there's things that are ne necessary or not. Um, but we always have the opportunity to revise if we feel a need, okay? So I just want to qualify that a little bit. Mary, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else to that explanation. Yeah, I, your comments were well stated. And certainly if the board wants to add language to the, those policies, we certainly can bring them to the board at the next board meeting or whenever the board deems appropriate to consider that. Thank you, Mary. All right. But in the interim, clearly the administration at this time has communicated its expectations that students will be wearing masks and the means for enforcing those, uh, those safety rules. Very good. Any other comments? Susan? So related to JLCC, I'm, I'm wondering, Mary, was, what was the thought process for not including the sample language from CASB that speaks to management of common communicable diseases will be in accordance with Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment or local public health department guidelines. A student who exhibits symptoms of a readily transmissible communicable disease may be temporarily excluded from school attendance. There, there, the honest answer to that is that we are still considering policies and the policies related to communicable diseases, long-term illnesses, uh, EBBA, EBBAR, the two superintendents policies, and the one on school closings and cancellations are still under consideration. The communicable disease and infection transmission, uh, we wanna make sure that they're reviewed uh, carefully uh, with our appropriate departments, um, including are, are departments who are most responsible for addressing those things. And we certainly will likely be bringing revisions back to the board uh, soon. Okay, I was just asking because we are relying on working with them very closely with the dashboard data and everything, so. So policy yeah. JLCC is not, uh, has not been reviewed yet. Uh, that's currently, I think Mary has said that's being reviewed by senior uh, administration, but it very well could come back, Susan, to have those. Right. So you're looking at the existing policy, it's like 17 years old. <laughs> so I think it is due for a, for a look at, so thank you. Yeah, Krista, go ahead. Um, so I just kind of wanted to follow up on what Ke Kevin had said and then Director Ray. Um, so I guess my expectation, because I've kind of been asking about the COVID policies for a while and the face covering in particular, and I understand um, that these board policies are broad enough to give the superintendent um, authority to, to manage these in, in the way. And I think, um, Ted, the way you guys have described the restorative justice and the education, I think it all sounds great and I really appreciate it. My concern is um, that as a board member, the, the face coverings is, is important. I think it was important to all of us as we made our decisions about hybrid and hopefully we'll be making future decisions about being able to go to school um, full time. But that is essential. And right now, the way our board policies are, there's nothing that would require that. And if, if for instance, the superintendent or staff um, changed their mind. And I, I even kind of think that with the student one, it, it kind of leaves it up to principals. And 
Um, I just would like it to be more clear. I'd like to add it to both the student dress code and the staff dress code, just in the same way, maybe using the same language um, that we used in the riding the bus um, policy. So that would be my suggestion for next time. So certainly when we have our agenda planning meeting this Friday, we can certainly have more discussion about what topics we want to put on the agenda and propose revisions, directors, that maybe you would like to propose for our next meeting. Well, and I would even go so far as to say that um, I would present a resolution if we decide not to change our policies, because sure. I think it's, it just needs to be more clear that that is the expectation. It's not subject to the discretion of principals. Um, it is a board expectation. Mm -hmm. so. point, point well taken, and I, I would have no issue with seeing us add some revised language Krista to, um, you know, like I said, to really give our administrator support, yeah. really. It's, it's not just that okay. we're trying to override their uh, ability to put these in place, but we really want to give them some support. In terms absolutely. Of, yeah, I appreciate you yeah. helping me with that. That yeah. is absolutely correct. So directors, we got about two minutes. Um, anything else we wanted to discuss with Mary? Uh, Susan's got one. And then Mary, if there's any burning thing on your side of the uh, ish of, of your wherever you are <laughs> if there's anything that you wanted us to know before we go into our regular session but Susan go ahead so Mary I really do appreciate all of your work on this um, title nine uh, mm -hmm. I know training is something that is important to be covered for both personnel and the board and I'm wondering if that's been discussed oh, oh we've discussed it uh, director me <laughs> Um, training is um, very important and we have required all of our staff to engage in about a five to 10 minute training so that they are, are aware of their obligations to report um, any sexual harassment or inappropriate sexual conduct that they see in the school setting, whether it be related to employees or students who they should report to. Additionally, um, so that training was rolled out last Friday. Uh, additionally, we have set up a website for all staff. So all of the policies applicable to Title IX and non-discrimination mandates are readily available to our staff and to our public. And it also will publish our training. So our training module will be posted on that website. Additionally, our legal department has undertaken a membership for the entire district in ATIXA. It's a national organization that provides training uh, for administrators and employees uh, specifically related to Title IX. And our administration has undertaken and will be undertaking plans to engage in um, the, the lengthy, more sophisticated training uh, so that they can meet their responsibilities to be investigators in appropriate circumstances. Ted will be undergoing training to enhance his skills as our Title IX coordinator and our decision maker, uh, Dr. Tucker, will have opportunities and engage in training as well. And the, any individual administrator he may designate to assume the responsibilities of decision making. So we are well aware of those responsibilities um, we are undertaking and exploring options to try to undertake this training in as cost efficient a manner as possible, because clearly um, this kind of training is not free. And so we are working to uh, identify those resources, along with trying to find the time to do the training, because something has gotten in the way of uh, lots of our good intentions uh, so that we can get ready to open schools. And I think we all know that that something is COVID-19. And so once we get our schools open, we'll be making efforts to engage in that training, Director Meek. And we definitely assume it as a responsibility. And clearly we will be making uh, training opportunities available to our Board of Education and all of our administrators and our staff who want to engage in more sophisticated training. And we are in fact working with CIPG, our legal department is working with CIPG. Uh, there's great folks over there who have worked with us to develop our short enhanced succinct training so everybody knows where their, our policies are. 
but we're working on a more sophisticated training for all of our staff at this time. Very good. Thank you, Mary. Again, thank you and your team for navigating through the complexities of policy setting. We appreciate that. So board, we are gonna take about a four minute intermission and then we'll come back to call to order our regular meeting. Thanks again, Mary. Thank you.
Douglas County School District Board of Education meeting for August 18th at about 6.02. We want to welcome all those folks that are tuned in to us as well online. Um, we are currently present at the Wilcox Building with our cabinet members as well, following our appropriate guidelines for masking as well as safety protocol. I'll begin with roll call. Uh, Director Chancha Shore is absent and excused. Director Graziano. Here. Director Hansen. Here. Director Holtzman. Here. Director Lung. Here. Director Meek. Here. And Director Ray is here. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, I think I can officially say we are back to school, and uh, I know on behalf of every Hall of Directors, uh, we are just so impressed with the first couple days, Dr. Tucker, the, the work that the staff has done, our educators, the cabinet, it's just uh, gone, on, gone off without a hitch. And so just want to congratulate um, all our staff for job well done and navigating some very complex circumstances, but I'll tell you, all the comments we're hearing is that there's just gratitude and appreciation for having that smaller group time with the teacher uh, to get familiar with that child. And I really think this is going to show up in a different way in terms of a benefit that we're going to have a better understanding of our kids like we've never had before because of this kind of work. So again, hats off to uh, all our educators. Um, just know that we are just deeply, deeply impressed and, and grateful for the work you're doing uh, for the sake of our kids. So with that, I will move on to acceptance of agenda. Is there a motion? Move to accept the agenda. Second. Motion moved by Graziano, seconded by Holtzman. Let's vote. Uh, Director Graziano? Uh, aye. Hanson? Aye. Holtzman? Aye. Lung? Aye. Meek? Aye. Ray, aye. Passes unanimously. Next on our agenda is student comment. And we're delighted to finally get back to where we actually can hear from our kids. Um, we have our three leaders of student advisory group, Jacob Hall, Jenna uh, Parazzi, and Emma Peters are with us. I believe I'm looking at the screen to see if we've got them on yet. Um, but I will just say that these uh, three leaders, Director Lung and I have the opportunity to speak with uh, a week or so ago, and I am so excited about their vision and things they want to do with student advisor groups. So we've asked them to kind of help us set the stage a little bit because we all are about kids and just have them kind of talk with us a little bit about what they're thinking. There they are, I see a couple of them. Yep, Jacob, Emma, all right. And Jenna, welcome. So I don't know which one of you guys want to start out, but we want to hear from you. Anything regarding student advisor group, but also just your first impressions of how school's going. So who wants to talk first? Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and start. Hi, Emma, go thank ahead. You guys. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having us today. So I'm going to start off by talking about kind of what we've done this year. So far, we've really just sent out the student application to both our new and returning student advisory group members. Um, within this application, we kind of outlined some various things regarding COVID. Specifically, we mentioned guidelines if we do in-person meetings to make sure that we're both following the state and district uh, health mandates. We also asked for some leniency from our members uh, regarding how we're gonna do this this year, kind of figuring things out on a weekly basis. Um, we did mention or ask a question regarding the a possibility of virtual meetings for our members, making sure that they're able to return, attend those. Um, and then talking to our returning members about how our last semester went with Zoom meetings, uh, what they thought went well, what they thought could be improved and so forth. Um, and then one of our big things this year is focusing on stu student communication, and I think this year that's extremely important. One of the main ways we're thinking about doing that is through a website of sorts that would be both a hub for the student advisory group members, but also students within the district. This would include a hub of information for students regarding processes to go through if they have issues with the teacher, if they needed to get into communication with people at the district level, and also information about our student advisory groups and our subgroups that we're doing, making sure that there's some intercommunication there. And then there'll also be some a uh, place at least for student comment to make sure that our students are being heard within the district and that this website will again be accessible by students, um, kind of hoping for 
all grade levels to be access, make this website accessible for them. And then also make sure that we're really getting that student comment back this year. That's great. Jacob? Thanks, Emma. Yes, go ahead, Jacob. I think Jenna was going to go next, but. Oh. Okay, Jenna, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I can go. <laughs> Um, so in the past couple of years, as you guys know, we've been really focused on our subgroups. And so those are basically small groups, for those of you who don't know, who focus on specific issues that they found in Douglas County, and they try to formulate solutions to those issues. And so last year we had four groups. They focused on mental health, real world classes, being eco-friendly, and then school safety. So last spring, these groups shared all their hard work and all their progress with the board. And we're really excited to continue these groups this year and to bring them from the research stage to the proposal stage. So as Emma mentioned earlier, the application process is going to be really important to understanding where we're going to spend our time this year. Um, all the students on SAG are going to be asked what they're really interested in, and that'll kind of shape what subgroups we're going to be continuing and potentially what subgroups we could add. And so um, I'm pretty sure I can speak for and the other sub, the other leaders and I, but we're really excited to welcome back these subgroups, and we really want to continue these guys and get them to the proposal stage. All right, I'll hand it off to Jacob now. Thanks, Jenna. Thank you. So, in terms of how we're trying to continue the next year with COVID, um, as Emma said, we're going to be following all state and district guidelines for COVID safety, um, and we understand that these can be ever changing. So, we're really not attached to anything right now. Um, so far, we've discussed the idea of some sort of hybrid model where a select few of us leaders are meeting in person and then leading a Zoom call or something like that for the rest of our participants. But again, we understand that at some point, we're probably going to have to go fully remote. So we are also prepared to do that when the time comes. Um, no matter what, though, we're going to be meeting throughout the year, either in person or virtually uh, to continue with these objectives that Jenna was talking about. And we're really looking forward to doing that. So, yeah, that's great. Well, thanks you three for setting the stage in terms of the work that you guys are focused on. I love the idea in particular of building off of what you did the year before, because uh, I know sometimes it feels like that we get to something really good and then all of a sudden we change and then we start all over again. But I, I know you guys are really committed to uh, seeing that continuity since all three of you were on the SAG last year. So we are really fortunate to have three incredible leaders to lead the way. I would be interested though, um, any of you, what's your first impressions of, of how things are going with this orientation week? Any, any thoughts, any anxiousness about school, anything that you're looking forward to? What, uh, what are just some candid thoughts you might share with us? Yeah, um, I know I'm really excited to be going back and seeing my teachers and fellow students and stuff. Um, I was fortunate enough to be a part of Link Crew yesterday, welcoming in our freshmen at, one of my, at my school at least. Um, and so that was really fun. It's been confusing kind of adapting to the different things. We have one-way hallways now um, and making sure that we're following those guidelines and then wearing the mask all day. That's been an adjustment for sure. Um, <laughs> but it's been, it's been, it's going. It could be worse, but it could be a lot better. But we're working towards that, definitely. And the hybrid model really is working, I guess, in the aspect that I notice that our administrators are able to change things on a day-to-day -day basis if they didn't really work out that first time. Um, so that's been really great. Great. All right. What about Jenna? What do you want? What are your thoughts? Uh, sure. So I guess it was kind of surprising just having super small class sizes. I think going to a larger high school, it's really interesting to just be in a class with like less than 10 people. Yeah. So that was something that really like, you want to adjust to. But so far, it's been good so far. People have been pretty good about wearing their masks. Like uh, Emma said, the administration has been able to have a lot of flexibility and adapt things. And so it's been pretty good so far. Great. Great. Jacob? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of just echoing what they're saying. So for what I saw, um, I was with Emma at the Link Crew event as well. And it was really interesting to see. It's definitely going to take getting used to. And we don't really have the routine down yet, if I'm being honest. But that's understandable because we were only there for one day. And the only other issues I've seen are like some of the cohorts made it so that there's like three people in one section of a class. And then the other section has 11 or 12 or more which is completely understandable. I know it's not possible to get everyone in, but that's going to be interesting to navigate for certain kids in certain classes. So I just thought I mentioned that too. Sure. 
I love it how you set the tone for how we have to be agile this year. And I love it, you know, the, I think Emma, you mentioned, and, and uh, Jenna too, the flexibility of administration to be able to pivot very quickly now <clears throat> in, this, in this current model. So, um, you know, I, I'm just so grateful to have students like you guys that set the model that says, you know what, uh, it may look different tomorrow and that's okay. And, um, you know, for sure, we're just all figuring this out together and, and I just appreciate your positivity. Directors, do you have any other questions for our three leaders that you're wondering about? Anything that they just spoke about or th anything else that you'd like to know? Uh, Director Lung? Hey, I'm so honored to be uh, one of the two uh, board member uh, for the SAG and uh, I wish you guys a wonderful year and thank you very much for your leaderships at uh, stepping up to uh, take this group you know, into a even a much better organizations. Um, for that, I want to thank you very much. I just want to uh, hear what is your thought. Uh, since we have been um, having uh, e-learning since March and not having any um, uh, in-person learning, so can you, from your experience, tell, tell me what kind of um, um, what kind of, what's good and what's bad from your experience and uh, in this school years, what would you think would be a good approach for us to reopen the school? I mean, from, from just from your personal you know, perspective or what you hear from your uh, fellow student. Yeah. Um, in terms of reopening the schools, I know especially at the high school level, there's a lot of fears for going back to full day or full week, I guess. Um, part of that is also because our high schools, some of them can be really overcrowded and the feasibility of that just doesn't seem very logical. Um, but I also know that students are really wanting that in-person time with their teachers. That's something that I know I really missed in the spring semester last year um, and really happy to have the opportunity to return to. Um, but we also, there's kind of, to be honest, there's a general feeling of like, when are we gonna go online? Not more of an if. Um, and so that kind of sets the tone for in school, but kind of keeping with that hybrid, I think a lot of the students are really happy to see their teachers again. Right. Any, anybody else wanna weigh in, Emma or Jacob? Sure. Um, I, I, kind of what Emma was saying, I know I've been talking with a lot of my friends and uh, same sort of ideology going in is that a lot of us are taking this as a time to meet our new teachers and meet our new classmates. But uh, basically all of us are fully prepared to go to online. It, it just feels like that's going to happen at some point. So that's something that all of my friends and I have been talking about a lot is how we're just trying to um, ask all the questions we need to while we're there and get to know everyone. But uh, we're ready for online too. Right. Jenna, any thoughts? Closing thoughts. Yeah, it kind of sounds like a broken record at this point, but I would totally agree with Emma and Jacob. Um, I think at this point, it's more of a when. It would be really nice to keep uh, staying in this hybrid model, but I, I think, like Jacob said, a lot of my friends don't have faith that the kids can stay without COVID for that long. Yeah. But it's nice to be in person while we can and kind of make the most of it, get to see some friends, get to see some teachers, and figure it out from there. Sure. Well, you three have, have certainly laid down the gauntlet for our community to really step up and help you because I, I hear all three of you saying, we think online learning is just inevitable, that it's going to happen. So, so the challenge to our community is to not let that happen, to do all the right things so that we are keeping our positivity rates low so that our kids can still have that in-person learning. So I appreciate you guys setting the stage for that. And I hope our community is, is, is hearing this loud and clear. Our kids want to be in person. They want that personal relationship with their teachers. And they really don't want to go to online learning <laughs> if they don't have to. So, But I appreciate you guys, again, for, for setting this tone for our meeting tonight. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, we'll be looking forward to continuing to check in with you guys uh, on a regular basis. So have a, have a good rest of your evening. Thanks. So next on our agenda is, is public comment. The board values hearing diverse viewpoints from a broad spectrum of citizens throughout our community, specifically items listed on tonight's agenda and issues that impact the educational needs of our students. Two policies guide how public comment to the board is received. Board policy KE, public complaints, 
and Board Policy BEDH public participation at board meetings. Policy BEDH also explains that since the board's responsibility is setting policy for the school district, members of the public should direct the comments to policy matters and notes further that citizens are strongly encouraged to contact the teacher, building principal, or superintendent first with questions or concerns. Board Policy KE outlines the process for responding to grievances and complaints and explains that the board believes that complaints and grievances are best handled and resolved as close to the origin of concern as possible. Therefore, we encourage the proper channeling of concerns. For example, concerns that involve a child should begin with the teacher, then the building administrator, the director of schools, assistant superintendent, and superintendent before appealing to the Board of Education. Given the remote format of this meeting, there are some additional directions I would like to provide those who are making comments tonight. As it has always been our practice, those wanting to make public comment are requested to complete an online form prior to three o'clock of the meeting. Those who were signed up for this time received an email with directions for calling in. Once called in, your phone will be muted until your name is called. You will be able to listen to the meeting via the phone, but you will not be able to speak until unmuted. Please make sure that you are not running the meeting on a computer in the background and that you are in a quiet environment. Once I call your name, please state your name and ask if you can be heard. I will, re will respond for you to continue. I would also remind commenters that we want to continue to maintain a decorum of mutual respect and would ask that speakers refrain from using individual names in an offensive manner as this only distracts from the issue of concern. It is also important to note that the board follows Robert's rules of orders to guide it in participating in an orderly, fairly conducted meeting. Under those rules, if a director calls for a point of order, all discussions and comments should stop so that a, deter a determination can be made as to whether a procedural rule or board policy has been violated. Therefore, if a point of order is made while the public comments are being made, I, or if I interrupt, the speaker should pause until otherwise directed to continue. The speaker's phone will be muted until asked to continue. Each speaker will be allotted up to three minutes to address the board. Please know that this is our time to listen without engaging in discussion. So we'll now proceed with public comment. Our first caller is Angela Nesty. Angela, are you there? Okay, we're gonna pause, we don't see Angela. We'll go on to the next is Cindy Bauer. After Cindy Bauer is Liz Crow. Is Cindy Bauer there? Nope. Okay, and Liz Crow, are you there? Mr. Sethi, did you think Ms. did you think that Liz Crow was on? Okay, one more. So we'll put a hold on on her. Moving on to Brian Thompson. Brian Thompson, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Thompson, go ahead, please. All right, I had some technical difficulties just as we started here. Um, so I'll try to remember my statements that I looked up. Um, at the last board meeting, it appeared that the primary decision to go to the hybrid model was due to the positivity rate of 5.2 versus a 5.0 rate. As of August 9th, that value appears to be 3.0. So I uh, started to inquire uh, through the road to return package on the website exactly what the criteria was for um, selecting the, the learning model, the frequency that we evaluate that model and the current status, but I wasn't able to find anything. So I emailed a question uh, into the, um, through the, the website to I think the communications uh, item. And the response I had is, I don't have it right in front of me anymore, uh, was something akin to the, the school board's decision uh, to return is um, uh, looking at the Douglas County's uh, safer at home and that there was implied there was a dashboard to make those criteria. And so I guess when I, I looked at it, um, one, I couldn't find a, a dashboard on the website or any other um, area where the 
evaluation criteria was at. So my question to the board here is, what is the specific criteria for the selecting the learning model, the frequency of that model, uh, or evaluating uh, the, the, the criteria, the current status of the criteria, and where is that information available to the public? And then additionally, uh, is there any um, cons consideration for looking at differences between uh, school levels? Um, I've seen from the Colorado data that there's perhaps a, a, as much as a two times difference of risk between the elementary schools and the higher level schools. But overall, Douglas County has, I think, five hospitalizations for persons 18 years and younger out of a total of 1,949 positive cases. And the, nice minute. Okay, yes, thank you, Mr. Thompson. I just quickly insert that with that topic is on our agenda tonight. So about 8.10, um, continue to tune into the board meeting and you'll hear more details regarding this dashboard and certainly be able to answer your, some of your questions that you've raised tonight. Thank you for your public comment. Next is Andy Jones. Mr. Jones, are you there? Yes, David, can you hear me? Yes, Andy, go ahead. Good evening, directors, Dr. Tucker and staff. Uh, I long for the days where I was there in the room with you and uh, look forward to that again sometime. My name is Andy Jones and I am here speaking as a board member on behalf of the Alliance of Douglas County Charter Schools tonight. Our board and member schools sent you a letter on August 6th and we have not yet received clarification on some remarks made during your last board meeting on August 4th. Now we understand that you've been very busy, 150,000 emails are lined up in, in your inbox, we understand that. But at that meeting, Dr. Tucker and certain board members seemed to suggest that opening schools five days per week under current circumstances would run counter to an order or standard by the governor. Specifically, Dr. Tucker said that the district could not legally open for five day in-person learning under our current Safer at Home executive order issued by Governor Polis. This is simply inaccurate. Many districts who are not in protect our neighbor status are opening their schools for five days in-person learning. In fact, I'm pretty sure the governor himself is sending his kids to in-person school. In our letter, we requested that any guidance or interpretation of guidance that states that schools are not allowed to open full-time, please be sent to us. If that documentation is not available, we respectfully requested that the remarks be corrected. Not doing so will leave the impression that at best, charter schools that allow a five-day option are doing so illegally. And at worst, that these same schools are unreasonably compromising the safety of our families, children, and staff. We hope and expect that the board is not interested in allowing this perception, especially since both are utterly false. The district certainly has deliberated long and hard to select a hybrid model some of our charter schools have made the same choice. We have no doubt that the choice was made for appropriate reasons, unique to each community. However, to claim that the district had no choice due to public health orders, state guidance, or tri-county guidance, all of which applies to charter schools as well, is misleading. On behalf of the Alliance of Douglas County Charter Schools, Board of Directors, and its members, we look forward to a clarification of the record and close and collaborative efforts to safely serve every one of our children in the Douglas County School District. Thank you tonight for your time and have a great evening. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Next on the list is Blair Bradley. Blair, are you there? Yeah, uh, hi, this is uh, Glenn Herman, Blair Bradley's husband. Uh, we're sitting in together on this. Can you hear me okay? Very good, please go ahead. Great. Uh, first of all, appreciate the time and the opportunity to voice our opinion. Um, I'd like to echo a few of the comments that uh, yeah, some of the previous speakers uh, have made. And, and I think one of the most important uh, things to acknowledge is, is, you know, what we're doing here is, is trying to level set and establish a baseline for uh, the health of our children. And, you know, the health of our children is, is absolutely uh, paramount, I think, in in every parent's mind. And health consists of a lot of different things, right? You have physical health, which is obviously what we're 
concerned about here in regards to COVID, this uh, prevention of the spread of COVID and protecting our children. But there's also mental health as well. And, you know, to, uh, to have kids not be in school without the interaction with their peers or their teachers, without um, the social interaction or the quality of education that they can get on site. You know, we are concerned that that has a degradation of, uh, of the mental health aspect of our children. And, uh, you know, we've, we are for having uh, kids in school in regards uh, to addressing that. I think we've all been bombarded with um, a lot of different stats, a lot of different uh, media perspectives. And really, at the end of the day, you know, most people struggle with how to wrap their head around where we are with this uh, particular virus. But um, if you do some simple searches on the CDC.gov website, which is typically where I grab my information from uh, as a main source of information as being a government agency, I avoid the Washington Post or uh, New York Times or the other uh publications that might uh, skew uh, data. It's important to recognize where we are currently today based upon cdc.gov's uh, information. And as we, as we know, in Colorado, 1,850, maybe 1,900 cases in Douglas County. Uh, it's about 3.4% of the total cases in Colorado. Uh, there's an interesting stat on uh, cdc.gov's website that says an average about 7.3% of children uh, may test positive for that disease. So what that really means for us in Douglas County is about 135 kids total out of 1,850 cases in Colorado. So although that's a number, it's not that high. And when we take a look at almost 68,000 students in Douglas County high school systems, 134 kids that may test positive ultimately relates to about one fifth of 1% that may be positive. So I think that's a perspective that we do need to take into account as it relates to what is the true risk here. Also on CDC.gov's website, the hospitalization rate of children is eight per 100,000. So eight thousandths of 1%. So when we take a look at who's positive versus who's in the hospital, that's a drastic difference in risk factor. Very good. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Bradley. Next on our list, I think actually as I'm looking at the list, we do see, I think I saw Liz Crow on the list. Uh, Liz, are you there? Yes, Director Ray, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. I, first, I want to apologize for not being here the first time you called my name. I'm <laughs> No worries. Technical issues. Anyway, I want to thank you all for giving me the chance to speak tonight. Um, again, my name is Liz Crow, and I'm an intermediate learning specialist and the special ed team lead at Cherokee Trail Elementary in Parker. Um, I want you all to know that I love my job, and my point in speaking to you tonight is not to whine. It's just that I feel the need to inform you about some issues that I see in the special ed department, and some of those issues have been around a while, but COVID-19 has kind of exacerbated some of them. Um, the first one is that in 10 years, we've had five different special ed directors. That's five directors in 10 years. Um, the result is that our, our department doesn't have a vision. We don't have clear communication. A couple of good examples are um, one SPED coordinator just a couple of weeks ago told her one of her buildings that they had, the learning specialist had to work out how they were gonna support their e-learners or they would lose an FTE, they would forfeit it. Luckily, my building wasn't told that. However, unlike those other buildings that found out two weeks ago that they had to support their e-learners, I found out Thursday. And that was after repeatedly asking my coordinator if I needed to support those e-learners. Um, I have 32 students on my caseload. The average classroom teacher in my building has 16 students. Um, I have 27 students that I will be supporting in person four days a week and six students I will be supporting online. The reason, there's two reasons my numbers are so high. One is that we have an unfilled position in our building. And the other is that in my building, unlike the national average of 10% of our students being identified as having a disability and being on an IEP, 
my building is at 17%. Normally when a number is that high, it raises red flags that there's something wrong with the instruction in that building. Our files have been reviewed and it is true that we have 17% of our kids have a disability. And I would say that one of the reasons our numbers are so high is because there are eight charter schools in the Parker area. They have uneven abilities to provide special education services. As a result, our numbers are rising. So I thank you. I know my time is running out. I thank you all for listening to me again. Um, I just hope that you will take some of these issues into consideration when you make decisions. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Crow. Next on the list is Treva Brown. I don't see her name showing up. Is Treva Brown, are you there? No. Okay. Um, and we'll move on to Josh Jenkins is next on my list. Is Josh Jenkins there? Hi, this is Josh Jenkins out in Parker. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Jenkins. Go ahead, please. Hi, I don't have much new to add. I just wanted to echo what Mr. Thompson, Jones, and Bradley were saying. Essentially, is I'm interested as to when we're going to move to the protect our neighbors section of the dashboard and what other metrics you're using to get us there or not get us there. Um, and how often you review the Tri-County Health Department website, because I think as Mr. Jones said, the average age of death from COVID is 81 years old. The incident rate is about 50 per 100,000. And I believe the current hospitalization rate for COVID patients in the county is about 3%. So all the numbers I'm seeing are trending down. And I get that when schools open back up, they may trend back up, but Everyone seems to be in a rush to prepare for going back to 100% e-learning. And I just wanted to see why we're not rushing to get back in the classroom. And that is all. Thank you for your time. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. Next is Meredith Likes. Meredith, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Yes, okay. I'm here. Yeah. Just, there Sorry. we go. Barely hear you, Meredith. Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me better? Yes, that's much better, thank you. Okay, great, thanks so much for having me on. Um, I wanted to say thank you to the students who presented earlier tonight. They were all very impressive. However, I do think it's sad that every one of them ended by saying that they and their school friends all seem to think they will be going 100% online soon. Where is that coming from? Why are they thinking that? What, who is saying this to these kids? I've heard it in my own home. I feel like 100% online should not even be a consideration at this point. So it brings me to my question. Why is Douglas County not discussing the metrics to go back to full in-person school? Based on the metrics Dr. Tucker presented at the last meeting, we should already be pivoting toward returning to 100% in-person learning. The positive test rate has been dropping and was prior to the last board meeting, and it is currently, as of today, at 2.6%. Um, yesterday, it was at 27 so you can see it dropping just from one day to the next. In, a, in July, or in July um, Dr. Tucker pointed out that he wanted the numbers to be at 4% or below, and on his current dashboard, it says numbers below 5%. Um, the 14-day incidence rate has been well under 100 for over two weeks now. Today is, uh, today is at um, 49. Again, Dr. Tucker said that he wants this number below 100, and we can see that is way below that. So why are schools not opening for 100% in learning? Last board meeting, Dr. Tucker stated that it was, and I quote, not legal to open um, it's not legal to go um, back to full, full in-person learning based on the current, current safer at home guidance. Um, so my question is why are Cherry Creek School District elementary schools and our charter schools, even in our own district, returning to 100% in-person learning? Are these schools breaking the law? No, they are not because this information is inaccurate and it is important for parents to know that this is inaccurate information that Dr. Tucker is providing. 
Um, not to point out the flaws of your current hybrid model, but it is not, it's not the point that I'm trying to make because I am advocating for 100% in-person learning, but the current hybrid model does not make any sense from the stance of keeping teachers and students less exposed to COVID-19. If hybrid is to keep kids socially distanced, why aren't we discussing where kids will be when they are not in school? Um, because we know that they will be with their neighborhood kids, they'll be playing with friends, they'll be in daycare centers, they will be at base programs. They will not be in cohorts or social distancing. If you think about it, teachers will be more exposed to COVID-19. The kids in their classes will be in childcare or with their non-cohort friends for three days a week, they are not in class. Very good. That's all I have to say. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Likes. I'm gonna circle back just to make sure we don't have any other public commenters that signed up tonight that may have slipped online. So uh, Angela Nesty, one more chance to see if you are there. Cindy Bauer. Or Treva Brown. Okay, so this brings our public session to a close and just wanna thank our public commenters and I, I do believe if you continue to listen to our board meeting, you're gonna hear a lot of good information and good details and I will tell you that I've been witnessed to Dr. Tucker's viewing of metrics on almost an hourly basis in his office. Um, so I know metrics are important to him and so uh, later in our agenda, we will certainly um, hear from Dr. Tucker regarding the dashboard, the update, uh, the update proposal of that dashboard will be considered tonight as well. So I encourage all our public commenters because I believe some of the comments you've made will be addressed through that discussion. So again, thank you uh, one and all for providing public comment to the board. Next on our agenda is the adoption of the consent agenda. And these items include a agreement to update the building automation system at Rocky Heights Middle School, the Ingenuity Curriculum Resource Approval, Approval of the Ingenuity Spend, Approval of the Designation of the Committee Members for CHASA, Approval of a Short-Term Employment Contract Form for employees that are working short-term, and an Approval of a CCC Program Agreement with COVID Check Colorado, which will provide frequent access for our employees to have, uh, to be checked regarding their COVID status. So those items are on our agenda at this time. Is there a motion to approve? Director Lung? Well, I would like to uh, request to move number nine, number 10, both items related to uh, agility our from the consensus agenda. The, the reason is- um, No need to give me a reason, Director Lung. You can just simply state that you would like to have that moved off the consent agenda, so noted. And so I'm looking for a motion to approve the other items, number eight, 11, 12, and 13. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Motion made by Director Lung, seconded by Director Holtzman. Let's go ahead and vote. Director Graziano. So just, just to confirm, we're moving to move number nine off the consent agenda. Nine and 10. So both nine and 10 have been requested to be moved off leaving eight, 11, 12, and 13. And that's... So, all right, well, I, I vote no to that change. And yeah, appreciate that. Uh, unfortunately, but, consent agenda items, our procedure is we don't okay. uh, take a vote whether we uh, okay. uh, approve the, the, re the, the request. So anytime a board director require a request, an agenda right. item be moved, we accept that. Um, right. Immediately, so Got it's it's it. it's Move really the motion on the table is to approve consent agenda item, uh, consent agenda Move items eight, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Move to approve. All right. So motion was made by Director Long, seconded by Holtzman, Graziano. I assume that's a yes now. Yes. All right. Director Hansen. Yes. Director Holtzman. Aye. Director Long. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray. Aye. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move then to those two items, Ingenuity Curriculum Resource Approval and Approval of Ingenuity Spend. Uh, Director Lung, would you like, first of all, just an overview of those two items before you ask your questions? Are there specific questions that would help with the clarification that you're needing for those two items? Well, I think it's a very important topics that I think 
it requires some discussions because normally in the consent agenda, we just approve everything or not approve everything without any discussions. But energy is such a huge topic for our online learning. And I, I think there's a lot of community interest and also um, our staff would like to know more about this before um, we approve it without any discussions. And, and I do have some questions related to that and I also see another director previously emailed some very good questions and I think it is important for the public to hear them and that's the reason why I moved them out from the consent agenda. So I will remind um, Director Lung that we spent an hour and a half on this topic at our last meeting. Uh, Director or Ms. or um, Chief Academic Officer Marlena Gross-Taylor and her staff presented this to us in great detail uh, regarding the use of ingenuity. Um, so I think what I would like to do, given that, is what specifically are questions you have regarding the proposal. And remember, the two proposals are to approve it as a curriculum resource, and the second is to approve the spend for that resource. So if there are specific questions, that'll help our staff be able to address those. Well, for the financial piece, I would like to know um, the amount and how much is being covered by the care money, and what is the yearly maintenance, and are we saving anything from not using any current software or methodologies? Um, so that is the one related to the financial um, area. So Ms. Kataska, would you like to address that question? So the question being how much of this spend is being charged against the CARES funding? Ms. Kataska is our chief financial officer. Yes. And I'm sorry, President Dr. Ray Tucker. And, and directors, uh, we don't, she'll go ahead and answer the questions. We do have a presentation, Director Long, prepared uh, regarding the finances, but she's uh, ready now to, to address those questions. So, Dr. Tucker, would it be helpful to, well, I think we're specifically looking for the answer to the question of ingenuity, yes. but thank you for that, that there will also be a more broader summary of how those funds are being used. Yes, sir. Ms. Kataska. Is this on? Great. Um, so in terms of the funding for the Ingenuity contract, this is not a general fund hit at all. Um, we are actually using both of our relief sources and funding to cover this contract. It will be split funded about 400,000 into CRF and the other 400,000 into the ESSER funding source, which has a longer runway. Um, currently, the contract is a one-year term. Uh, it has the ability to, uh, as you know, you will review on a quarterly basis should we need to add more licenses and go above that 800,000 currently approved limit. So it could go above, up and be, up, above and beyond the 800,000 currently approved, but still would not be a general fund hit. Very good. Director Long, this is, this is your item. Any other further well, I, questions? I, I asked for items related to that. Um, that's just answering one of them. Please, go okay. ahead. Um, so, in, so uh, what's the yearly maintenance cost? And also, would, are, are we saving anything from the current um, usage of something you know, for e-learning by using this software? So the, the contract itself includes that annual ma maintenance and is a one-year contract. At the termination of that contract, we will re renegotiate and determine what our need is as, as a district for the service as a whole. Uh, in terms of cost savings, my understanding is that um, with the, the contract that we have, we have um, made with Edgenuity, they are actually waiving the fees that we're currently paying for credit recovery that uh, Edgenuity had previously provided. In addition to some pretty robust prof uh, professional development to make sure that student uh, staff are, are up to speed and ready to use uh, the services as school is starting. But um, yes. Ms. Gross-Taylor might be the, the better person to speak add, to. Yep. Yeah, I'll add something and then we do have Ms. Gross-Taylor available. One of the strongest aspects of Edgenuity is that one, our 200 plus teachers do not have to take time to create their own curriculum. They certainly will be able to modify the curriculum. Secondly, students are able to track the work that they are doing. They're able to assess their own work. When I look back at this uh, curricular resource, I go back to 2006 when I was a director of curriculum for a large suburban school district. And our teachers in my district who were engaging in flipped classrooms similar to our hybrid model had to create their own curriculum. 
They had to create their own assessments. We have this right now at our fingertips. Uh, Ms. Gross-Taylor. Good evening, directors, Dr. Tucker. Mrs. Gross-Taylor um, is our chief academic officer. Go ahead, Mrs. Gross-Taylor. As uh, Director Ray mentioned before, in our August 4th meeting, we gave a detailed uh, dive into edgenuity and uh, also mentioned at that time that when we brought this to, uh, to the board on the 4th, we reminded the board that we would be submitting the official uh, curriculum approval for that paperwork, uh, paperwork at today's board meeting, which is what is in the consent agenda item. And that we had a resolution in place that allowed us to review and make this purchase, especially in light of having such a quick turnaround to uh, schedule 6,000 students and over 200 teachers uh, into our e-learning instructional delivery model, 100% e-learning instructional delivery model. As, uh, as Kate already explained, uh, not only does it provide a host of, of tools to help students also keep track of their progress, but also accessibility features that will certainly ease how we meet the needs of all learners, in particular, our special education students, our uh, gifted and talented students, and our English language learners. Those accessibility features are embedded within the program. And our teachers have the ability, absolutely have the ability to uh, customize the, the experience for our students uh, during this time. I'd also like to remind the board that the $4 million curriculum spend that um, was approved uh, would certainly appreciate it. That focused primarily on just our elementary and just in our math, primarily in our math programming in our science programming. Had COVID not happened, and I shared this before on August 4th, we would be looking into our high school and our middle school curriculum because they are also currently uh, out of date with uh, what our teachers were able to use as resources and how it aligned to our new 2020 Colorado academic standards. So our Edgenuity program um, addresses those issues, takes the angst and lift off of our teachers where they can feel comfortable starting the school year, which is Monday. Our students will be starting on Monday, even in the e-learning setting. And uh, being able to start the school year, have confidence to know that what they are able to present as they become more familiar with their increased trainings around ingenuity meets the needs of, of all of our students, as well as provides the opportunity to uh, from K-12 to be able to go back and pull resources that are aligned and that are consistent to even areas that students uh, might have missed certain concepts during our remote learning in the spring, or as we now refer to as the COVID gap. So our ingenuity meets those needs in those areas. And finally, uh, it provides our SEL curriculum, which is something we've talked about since I started in this district uh, now two years ago and when we completed our strategic plan about making sure uh, the mental uh, well-being of all of our students is a priority, that we're making sure that their safety and mental health is a priority. And Edgenuity has that not only embedded within all of their lessons, but also additional resources that can be delivered uh, directly by the teacher as well as uh, through our counselors. We are also able to provide the edgenuity to our hybrid teachers at the secondary uh, level, both at middle and high school. And when we think about the hybrid schedule and when we think about having students uh, engage in independent learning two days a week, we definitely, or three days a week, we definitely know that our secondary teachers needed some more support. They share that with us in our remote learning survey. Uh, so we know uh, what they're wanting. The reason that we also wanted to choose Edgenuity um, from our school leadership team actually brought this to, to our attention and, and wanting this, uh, as they shared on the 4th, is that this has already been in our district for several years in, in, in several of our schools. So when we think about having to do a hybrid schedule, having to do e-learning, having a, a very quick turnaround to get these processes and, and schedules in place, we have to think about our teachers and what their load is and 
choosing to go with something that is more familiar in our district where we can lean on our teacher leaders who have been using this for several years to help support uh, the implementation and professional development of their colleagues is absolutely critical. Very Dr. Tucker, did I miss anything? No, you absolutely nailed it. Uh, two features that Ms. Gross Taylor mentioned. The professional development part is built in the cost. And secondly, we're gonna talk a little bit later uh, about an issue that the board has been passionate about since my arrival in April of 2018, that's student and staff support in regards to social and emotional learning. The uh, uh, Edgenuity uh, platform allows us uh, one more uh, way in which we can address social and emotional learning. And I know Director Lung has a couple other questions, I believe. Director Lung. Um, may I ask a couple follow-up questions? Please. Um, so you mentioned a while ago that um, th this uh, software has been used for several years for several schools. So, so that means that there's a lot, there's certain school or many schools did not use this. And um, so when we pay for this, are we going to make this um, the software for all the e-learning from now on, all the other software or whatever method that we are using is going to be obsolete. Does it save any money by consolidating into one platform? Because I mean, a while ago when I asked for the saving, I still do not hear whether there's any saving by, by, by having this. And secondly, as you mentioned that this has been used for several years for several school, but that means that there's still some school that has not used it. So the amount of money that we are paying right now, does it include training and continuous support um, for the staff that are not familiar with this software? Dr. Tucker? Yes, it absolutely. Yes, uh, we've had, in, during the last presentation, uh, Mrs. Mason talked about the professional development days we've had in place uh, starting August 4th. And so I'll ask, uh, I don't know if Ms. Mason is here with us, but I'll certainly ask Ms. Gross-Taylor to talk a little bit about the professional development days. But I want to emphasize again, Director Long, not only are we saving funds, but we're also saving time. You're saving uh, the time of 200 plus teachers from having to create their own curriculum to meet the needs of the 6,000 students and rising we have on our e-learning model. Ms. Gross-Taylor. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Tucker. So our professional development is going to continue. So yes, we've had some very intense uh, professional development that's been provided and also uh, identifying who those teachers and leaders are that can continue as well as Edgenuity continuing to provide their professional development uh, to us virtually uh, throughout the course of our use of this particular program. When we think about um, reevaluating what our, what our cost is at the end of the year, again, I would just like to remind everyone that our schools were, and our high schools had already elected to use Edgenuity prior to COVID for their credit recovery. Uh, Edgenuity definitely meets those needs for our students in the credit recovery piece, as well as being uh, NCAA uh, approved, uh, as well as offering a robust offerings of AP classes, honor level classes, our foreign language classes, and so forth. So this is saving us because, as Kate mentioned, uh, when we moved forward with this particular contract, Edgenuity um, did not charge us for the credit recovery pieces of that. And at the end of the year, if we we're not to have e-learning in this manner, that is, something, that is something that we absolutely would consider. The last thing that I'll share is that while we, um, while we did decide to go with Edgenuity as a school leadership and teaching and learning uh, team with, with input from our, our high school and middle school leaders, um, it's important to note that while other programs might have initially come across as cheaper, they might not have been as comprehensive. And we talked about that uh, during our comparison or on August 4th when we shared about Florida Virtual, that was our other top contender. Are there other online uh, curriculum programs that might have a cost for such as required textbooks that would be passed along to our families that are already impacted by this pandemic? So we wanted to be super sensitive to that fact and make sure that all of our students 
have access to, and all of our teachers have access to a core curriculum that becomes a foundation of our e-learning instead of open sourcing all of the different um, curriculums that are out there that our teachers were forced to do. And I've talked about that extensively with the open sourcing in our January, uh, January meetings around our curriculum spin. Final question, Director Long, and then we need to move on. Sure. Final question? Nope, okay. Thank you, Mrs. Gross-Taylor, Dr. Tucker, uh, Ms. Kataska, for that information. I will now, at this time, entertain a motion for, to approve Edgenuity as a curriculum resource. Move to approve Edgenuity, Edgenuity as a curriculum resource. Motion made by Graziano. Second. Seconded by Director Hansen. Any further discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. Graziano? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Holtzman? Aye. Lung? Aye. Meek? Aye. Ray? Aye. That passes unanimously. Next is the approval of the spin for Edgenuity, and Mrs. Kataska clearly stated that this does not come out of our general fund, it comes out of our other grant dollars to support us in this effort to provide an on-learning platform for our students. So motion to approve the spend. Move to approve the spend for Ingenuity. Ingenuity. Motion made by Graziano. Second. Seconded by Holtzman. Any further discussion? I do want to just highlight um, certainly that we, I think Mrs. Gross-Taylor pointed this out, that this is not typically how we do business as far as uh, approving something after it's already been committed. But I think we recognize that the unusual circumstances pushed us into a position where staff had to, had to make some decisions quickly before board could approve. So I do wanna just um, make note of that. And certainly we heard also that this has been a program that's been used previously. So I think we are, again, just um, trying to also clean up our processes with this, but also recognizing that the unique circumstances has put us into this position. So with that, I'll take a vote. Graziano? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Holtzman? Aye. Lung? Aye. Meek? Aye. Ray? Aye. That passes unanimously. Next on the agenda is the unofficial minutes for our previous Board of Education, is uh, for our previous Board of Education meeting. Is there a motion? I move to approve the minutes for our last meeting. Second. Motion made by Holtzman, seconded by Graziano. Let's vote. Graziano? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Holtzman? Aye. Lung? Aye. Meek? Aye. Ray? Aye. That passes unanimously. Next on the agenda is some information that we get to think about that's not COVID. So I'm really excited about this presentation. Uh, this is our Mill Levy Bond Oversight Ad Hoc Committee, their first annual report. And it looks like that Mr. Cosgrove is coming forward to do introductions. And we're looking forward to hearing about our progress due to our wonderful voters approving 5A and 5B. Mr. Cosgrove. Thank you, directors. On behalf of Kate, Kataska, our Chief Financial Officer, I'd like to introduce our Chair of the Millbond Oversight Committee, Mr. John Freeman. He will do introductions for his committee members who will give a brief presentation and answer any questions. I'd like to confirm that John is online now. There he is, Mr. Freeman, good evening. Hello, C can you hear me? Yes, we can, sir, please go ahead. Excellent, well, uh, greetings directors and Superintendent Tucker. Uh, I am John Freeman, the chair of the Millbond Oversight Committee, or what we call the MBOC. Uh, I have been extremely fortunate to have had the opportunity to assist with the formation of the MBOC and to then lead the MBOC as its chairperson. Due to the incredible interest in serving on the MBOC, the, community, the committee consists of volunteers from diverse backgrounds representing many aspects of the community. I'm proud to say that over the past year, these individuals have blended together as a team to ensure that the board's goals for the MBOC have been met and to provide the oversight promise to the community in verifying that their tax dollars have been wisely and appropriately spent. 
before I get into the presentation, I would like to recognize a few individuals. Uh, first, uh, with me tonight are two fellow MBOC members, uh, Vanessa Hoffman and Angie Riggett. Uh, Vanessa, along with Greg Miner and Joe Robinson, were instrumental in developing the inbox report in tonight's presentation. While the other inbox members could not be here tonight, I would like to thank each of them for generously giving their time to serve on the inbox. Uh, second, if I was there at Wilcox in the boardroom, uh, I would recommend that we give Richard Cosgrove, Jessica Killian with NV5, and their staff a standing ovation. They have done an incredible job of executing the bond funded projects derived from the master capital plan, from the initial planning to the actual construction. Clearly, these projects were shovel ready due to the intense pre planning and detailed knowledge of every building in the district. But being able to bring all of the moving parts together and spend 82 million or 28% of the available bond funds in under 16 months after accounting for losing two prime months due to the pandemic is an unbelievable accomplishment. Uh, may, may we at least give Rich, Jessica, and their staff a hand. All right. Okay. And now I will move into the presentation. See if we can change to the next slide. Okay. The, uh, the board promised the community if they passed the bill, the Mon bill, measure, uh, an oversight committee would be created for their transparency and ensure the funds were spent as outlined on the ballot, which was done. The MBOC was formed over the first half of 2019 with the charge to become familiar with the 2018 mill levy override and bond program and project list to monitor the progress of the improvements and programs being implemented to ensure MLO and bond expenditures are in alignment with the ballot language approved by the voters. Okay, next slide. See, we have met quarterly since our inception. Early activities and accomplishments included developing an understanding and distinction of the mill and bond funds and their appropriate uses. Uh, for the MLO, that would include operating costs such as salaries and benefits. For the bond, that would include capital expenditures such as security improvements, maintenance, new construction, transportation, and information technology needs. We also recognized and developed a deep appreciation for the due diligence put forth by the district to categorize and prioritize the many expenditures and projects to be undertaken. Next slide, please. Over the past 12 plus months, by reviewing the MLO expenditures, which have allowed the district to narrow the pay gap between DCSD and neighboring districts, uh, add school counselors at the elementary and middle levels, and increase support for special education and career tech. We also reviewed board bond expenditures, which included urgent capital expenditures to prevent interruption to education, facility improvements, new construction, expansions, and enhancements to security. It also addressed urgent shortcomings in transportation and IT infrastructure. Next slide, please. Uh, over the past year, about 42 million was spent from the mill, while 82 million or 28% of the bond funding was spent. Next slide. Now, I'm thrilled to say that this committee has not stayed in the office. <laughs> we have made several field trips to schools to visually see firsthand the dramatic impact the bond funds have made. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, as directed, the MBOC has submitted a first annual report, which outlines our structure and background, provides a high level overview of the funding, and guides interested stakeholders to more comprehensive information which is, is available on the district's website. Okay, next slide, please. So in summary, the MBOC is pleased to report to the board, residents and stakeholders of Douglas County that we find all expenditures thus far in alignment with the ballot language approved by the voters in 2018. Okay, 
Next slide. Okay. At this time, we would be happy to attempt to answer any questions you may have. Very good. Thank you so much, Mr. Freeman. And I've had the pleasure, I know, as, as other board directors to sit in on your meetings that you guide. And I must say that we are very fortunate to have you as a leader. Uh, your calm demeanor, your straightforward, uh, and, and, and you run those meetings so well. And, and really without any direction from us because this committee intentionally was created not to be a board committee, but really to be an independent committee that could really dig into the facts and make sure that indeed our voters are getting what they voted for. So I uh, just wanna say thank you to you as well for stepping into that leadership role and, and, and doing it so well. So, so thank you for that. Um, very concise presentation, I might add, and thank you for that as well. Um, board directors, do you have any questions regarding the, the presentation? Director Holtzman. I just wanted to say thank you again. Um, it, that was a great presentation. Um, I'm just wondering if you all have plans to share this presentation, this information with the greater community. I'm guessing that you do have those plans, but I'm hoping that we can um, share that. I'm not sure on our website, in the newspaper, if you've thought about that. Well, I, I'm sure we will post it on, the, uh, on our website. It's on the district's website. Um, and we can certainly uh, ask communications, you know, how we can distribute it further than that. Very good. Thank you. Mrs. Mrs. Rader is giving a thumbs up, Mr. Freeman, so she is glad to assist as well. But this is the news we need to share with our community to show that we are responsible stewards of the money they've entrusted with us and how wonderful it is to see this work continues, even in spite of a pandemic and the crisis that we're reacting to, the work that this uh, that, that this has accomplished is just a remarkable and truly the standing ovation for Mr. Cosgrove and, and, and all of the staffs that Mr. Cosgrove that you coordinate to make this happen is, is, is well earned for sure. Other questions, directors, regarding this presentation, regarding MBOC or any of the things we heard tonight? So, Mr. Freeman, you almost get a perfect uh, presentation star for the night because uh, I think you did so well that there's not that many questions, but we, I would just again echo how, how wonderful it is to see that this was accomplished way before this crisis occurred so that we can continue these efforts to provide our students with the best facilities possible as well as the, all the mental health work that we've done on the uh, mill levy side. So again, thank you for your oversight. And, th and please, on behalf of the board, thank um, all your committee for all the work they're doing to make sure that we are being good stewards with the monies that are, that are provided to us. So thank you very much. Yep, yeah, thank you. All right, we are gonna move on to our next topic, which is our superintendent report to give us some updates, uh, Dr. Tucker. They put the three minutes up there, Dr. Tucker. What's that mean? <laughs> well, I can't promise you I'm going to be done in three minutes, but I can certainly tell you uh, it's great to be ahead of schedule tonight. I'm going to do my very best to get us ahead of schedule. I had several items under the superintendent's report. I do uh, appreciate the discussion on edgenuity. We've already talked about that, so that will be one item that we will not discuss. But we're going to start off first with our update on the COVID-19 risk level dashboard that you've heard quite a bit about from our speakers and from our parents and emails that we've received. Also tag uh, teaming tonight will be Mr. Sethi and he's gonna get that pulled up here in a little bit. I, I will work to the next There we go. Okay, <laughs> very good. I also wanna let uh, Director Ray and directors, uh, our folks who are here and folks who are uh, tuning in, I want to let you all know that we do have two of our friends uh, from uh, Tri-County Health Department, Ms. Sager being one of the uh, two. Uh, Dr. Douglas was not able to join us uh, tonight. He's helping out the Aurora Public Schools uh, work their way through this. So again, a huge thank you to our folks in the uh, medical uh, community. So let's go ahead and get started and uh, Mr. Sethi, we'll jump back and forth in.
So uh, before I uh, start to talk about the DCSD risk level dashboard, and folks, I do appreciate, Stacey, I do appreciate you enlarging the font size so I can see. <laughs> A couple things. Uh, I, I normally don't um, respond directly uh, on the same day um, to any of our public commenters, but uh, some of the comments that they've made are certainly germane, and I'll go ahead and talk about that. This Douglas County School District risk level dashboard is for the Douglas County School District neighborhood schools. Now, I want to say thank you to uh, our speakers, uh, Mr. Jones in particular, uh, who represents the Douglas County Alliance of Charter Schools, because I'm glad that they are, one, following the governor's executive order, for which they're mandated to do, as well as all schools are as it relates to COVID-19, and they're following the health orders by Tri-County Health Department. So I do expect that all of us, neighborhood and charter schools, as a family here in Douglas County, will continue to follow those executive orders and health orders. Now, to that point, charter schools are semi-autonomous. How they open, how they run their schools, it's really up to their boards of education and their directors. So how they open during COVID or close during COVID really doesn't have anything to do with the Douglas County School District Board of Education. So I wanna make sure uh, we do have that point. And again, I wanna thank everyone in the Douglas County School District family for following the governor's uh, executive orders and the health orders. So uh, again, that uh, really gets it to the question as to why charter schools are operating differently. So hopefully uh, parents and visitors and listeners understand that distinction I just made. So let's move on with our dashboard. Uh, let's go back to the Previous slide, please. Okay, our dashboard will track and publish key metrics from various data sources on a regular basis, as Director Ray mentioned. We have this huge screen in our office. We've been watching these numbers all the way back to June. One of our uh, speakers talked about the recommendation we made in June, and with Dr. Douglas, I said if those numbers are at that particular point, then we should have in-person learning. Now, I was gonna save uh, this announcement to the end, but I'll go ahead and give a spoiler. If our numbers, folks, uh, continue to decline after Labor Day, we know there is, when you look at this stuff, because I've been eating and, and breathing it with cabinet members, after holiday, there is a huge spike. So that's why we have not jumped into full teaching and learning five days a week because if you look at the holidays, there is a spike, especially the folks who've, uh, watched, who've uh, been watching this stuff here. So here's the spoiler. If our numbers continue, we're going to begin to ease our full in-person teaching and learning with the elementary levels, then later with middle and high school. You've just heard it right here. Each key metric will be assigned a score indicating low to risk uh, from low to high risk. The dashboard assigns a score of zero to two for each key data point within the dashboard. The total of the scores, zero to 12, represent an overall safety rating. Now, I know Mr. Seth is gonna talk about this a little later when he steps up to the mic. We have to collect data. We've, we're going through orientation week here. Uh, as, uh, as our directors have said, particularly Director Meek, we're starting slowly. We're being very methodical, not to rush to open too fast to have to close back the fears that our students mentioned earlier. The rating is tracked over time and must represent a sustained change, seven to 14 days. One of our uh, uh, public commenters mentioned that. We have that in place. To consider a change in DCSD's current attendance model. Next slide, please. Some dashboard data points. The DCSD risk level dashboard is built on the following six key data points. Our old dashboard was on the website, still is on the website, this new draft information will be on the website as well. Here are the six data points. Current public health order. Let's talk a little bit about that when we get to the dashboard because the current public health order covers the entire state, it covers neighborhood, and it covers charter schools. Test positivity rate, we're looking at a 14-day average. Hospitalizations, looking at the daily rates there, the numbers of hospitalizations. 14-day incident rate per 100,000 residents. And five daily cases, we're even looking at the three-day average. And what is unique about the Douglas County School District's 
uh, dashboard, which I have not seen, and I certainly appreciate the recommendation from our board and community members, we're including DCSD staff school COVID-19 tracking data that's unique to the Douglas County School District. You're not gonna see that anywhere else, okay? Next slide, please. So here are the uh, various levels. Zero score, that's a low risk. Data demonstrates the virus is under control. A one is a medium risk. Data demonstrates there is a concerning trend. There is an upward trend, and we're gonna monitor it closely and be prepared to react. Be prepared to react to hybrid. Be prepared to react to fully e-learning. And two is your high risk. Data demonstrates significant community spread and it's uncontrolled, which means that we're gonna to go to full e-learning. Next slide, please. I'm gonna talk about this slide, and then Mr. Sethi, please take the other uh, couple slides. This is the dashboard we have been working on for over a month now. We've also shared this dashboard with our colleagues along the front range. This is our return to school dashboard. It's our COVID-19 risk level guidance, and folks, this is just one of many pieces of data. Just one of many pieces. So the top three areas, and I wanna clear up this legal stuff here as I go through these top three levels. These top three uh, risk level guidance are from the governor. Thomas Tucker did not make these up, nor the Douglas County. Uh, under the governor, there is one, a stay at home to safe at home and protect our neighbors. Let's look at some of the characteristics of each one. Starting to the far right, stay at home. At 10% of greater positivity rate, that's staying at home, or two, and 200 or more incident rates per 100,000. And then we'll also look at hospitalizations that I mentioned, deaths and state metrics, that's stay at home, stay at home, then we move over to safer at home. That positivity rate uh, is between 5% and 9% positivity rate. As some folks pointed out, uh, we're slightly below that positivity rate there for safer at home. And then the incident rate is 26 to 199 uh, out of 100,000 cases. Again, we're gonna look at hospitalizations, death, and uh, state metrics. Then the metrics that we're really looking for is to protect our neighbors. We all want this in Douglas County, across the state and the country. That's less than 5% positivity rate, as someone pointed out. We're at about 2.7% now. We are at that level. And a zero to 25% incident rate. We are above that. We're at about 56 per 100,000 cases. And we're gonna to continue to look at hospitalizations death and state metrics. So let's talk briefly about uh, my quote uh, from our last meeting about le the legality of this. First and foremost, we can remember back uh, when COVID started to hit our community and Tri-County Health came in, one of our fine restaurants, uh, a couple of our fine restaurants that I love here in, in uh, Castle Rock opened to a large crowd. Tri-County Health got involved with the sheriff's department and said they had to close. So that's where the legality uh, statement from me came. Now I do wanna emphasize a lot of this folks has really evolved. These things here are more now about guidelines and that's why we have our friends on uh, Tri-County uh, on the line with us to talk about guidelines and suggestions. And I'll talk about uh, what each one of these looks like as it relates to these three orders, the, again, these three government, uh, governor's orders here. So let's look at, go back to stay at home, which is an easy one. Uh, you see the metrics there, 100% e-learning, all students and staff transition to 100% e-learning, and thank goodness we do have, especially for our folks on the e-learning track, we have ingenuity in place to help our teachers out. And we'll continue with virtual e-learning interactions. Now let's move over to safe at home where we are right now. Cohorts of students rotate between two days of in-person learning and two days of independent learning from home and one day of live online instruction if, if best for your community. This is the new guidance that we've gotten from the state and from Tri-County. So it's now saying if best for your community. I wanna add this as well. 
The Douglas County Board of Commissioners, I've been in close contact with them and I know board members have as well. They do not determine whether or not school districts either go uh, have a, use the uh, hybrid learning model or the in-person model or e-learning model. That's not up to the commissioners, but we do work closely with Tri-County Health and our commissioners. It also helps when you're working with your commissioners, they have a pulse on what's happening in your community, and if they apply for a variance for in-person learning, that's working with the school district, and it makes our decisions a lot easier in working in collaboration with the county officials. And all three uh, in these models here, face coverings, as uh, Director Long mentioned earlier, it's required for all staff and students. Again, I'm standing here keeping my six foot distance. Uh, we're here at a gathering. I can speak in the mic and maintain my distance. And once I step away, I'll put my mask on. For our students who are riding the buses, face coverings mandatory. Students in class, pre-K through 12, face coverings mandatory as well as staff while we're indoors. We wanna make sure we maintain six feet of distance where feasible. That's another thing that has changed, folks, and I ask you all to please uh, uh, show some patience, show some grace, because this is constantly changing. Uh, when we received guidance early on, it was, you know, you could live with three feet, but uh, six feet is okay. There was a greater emphasis now on six feet, again, were feasible. Now let's go over to in-person learning. Uh, in school, five days a week, normal class schedule, and we're always going to maintain an e-learning option available across all three learning models. Face coverings required for all staff and students while indoors and on buses. Social distance by six feet were feasible at secondary level. At the K-5 level, uh, we would like to maintain six feet, but you don't have to because of uh, we've seen the research now, we have our experts who advised us since June that our younger kids are less likely to transmit the disease as much as our secondary, our middle and high school students. Any questions about uh, this, uh, our dashboard and how much we've been able to evolve with our help uh, from our friends with Tri-County and with CDPHE? Uh, if there aren't any questions, I, I do want to uh, go ahead and emphasize that Douglas County does not yet meet the criteria for protect our neighbor, but we're very close. Uh, protect our neighbor requires an incident rate of less than 25. We're at, at 56, unless the test uh, positivity is less than 5%, uh, in, which case, uh, in which case we are. We're less than uh, 5%. And... Um, the incident rate has to be uh, of, uh, between uh, well, 50 and less. Again, we're not quite there yet. In Douglas County, we're at about 56%. So I have no doubt that we're gonna eventually get to protect our neighbor. And I do wanna make this point as well, uh, board of directors and folks who are tuning in. We have to also be cognizant that we're utilizing different, and what, I, what I mean by uh, we, different folks are utilizing different types of metrics. Some folks are looking at Tri-County Health metrics. Other folks are looking at other health departments in their jurisdiction. And then thirdly, some folks are looking at the state's metrics. They are slightly different. But I'm looking forward to in the next couple of weeks that the uh, partnership for the Denver Area uh, Health Group will give school districts one set of metrics to use one dashboard. Okay, any other questions about this dashboard before we move on to the fine nuances of our uh, entire system? So I'm wondering, Dr. Tucker, I know we also have, this dashboard is a separate agenda item later on yes. in our board meeting. Um, I wonder if we should hold off on the questions and go ahead and give us the complete overview. Very good. And then we'll dig over deeper into the dashboard okay. at that time. Sounds good. Next slide. Mr. Sethi. So as Dr. Tucker was talking about the data points which feed into it and then the velocity of data as we said because the speed at which is coming and the sources at which is coming from is just tremendous, which could be a good thing. We were asked to bring together the key metrics as we discussed earlier into a simple, easy to consume dashboard and we're collaborating with our communications team to start publishing this information 
on a regular basis onto our website. So our community, our students, anybody who wants to see sees DCSTs or Douglas County specific data and the other data points. So this information is from the Tri-County Health <clears throat> website and it focuses only on the Douglas County numbers. On the left top, you see the percent positive test. As of, I think that we pulled in this data today, it's around 1.9%. Um, at the bottom, you see 14-day incidence rates, and we are about 49.58, and this obviously keeps updating on a daily basis. Um, on the right-hand so top side is the daily hospitalizations by county. What we are focusing on in this chart is the stability. So if you look at the last few days, weeks of data, it's pretty flat line, which would tell us that this is stable. The hospitalizations are not going up, as you would see in the March data points, or going down at a pretty steady rate. Um, so it's, it's stable is what we are considering it to be. And the bottom left, on the bottom right, is the daily COVID-19 cases by the county, which is for Douglas County. And obviously that is also stable to kind of sustain decreases at this point. So these are four data points which we are pulling. And if you go to Tri-County's uh, COVID dashboard, there's a ton of information for all the counties in one page. We are filtering it out, pulling in the key metrics which Dr. Tucker was talking about, putting it in one place. So that's one data point into that. The next one, is the school data. Um, really at a very high level, our school staff, nurses and the healthcare staff, and our central office healthcare staff has been collecting information at a tremendous pace and evaluating that information at a tremendous pace and making decisions on quarantining, isolation, and obviously positive test is a positive test. But they have been collecting that information are, are now able to kind of give us a succinct picture which we'll show you in a graph in about two slides from now. But what you're gonna see on this is these two data points. So this is student, we may have moved one further. There should be a staff one if you move one back. There we go. What we'll see first is the staff numbers for quarantine, isolated, and positive on a total. And we're giving you a baseline of how many staff members we're generally considering. Obviously there's ADA accommodations and staff members which are absent on a daily basis. So that number is going to fluctuate. But roughly 8,300 staff members is what we consider DCSD staff population. Now the next slide. And this is the second part of that data point is going to be around students. And again, on that we are considering the DCSD neighborhood student data collection. So that number is going to be based off the DCSD neighborhood student counts and what's coming into our schools. Next one. So the data collected to now, and we have mapped this out, take a moment to kind of take this in. Um, you see the positive in the red box, the isolated in the yellow, and the quarantine in the green teal color. Um, and at the very top of this, we calculated the percentage positive as a percentage of our entire population. So if you think of total staff population, it's 8,400, you would take the percentage positive, which is the number at the top, just to make it simple for everyone. If there's math geeks, they're welcome to come and talk to us. But just to keep it simple, we just kind of use that as a metric to see how we are on the positive cases. And then the other numbers just add up to kind of give you a sense of the quarantining, isolation, and positive cases. If you wanted to go back and see the differences, the quarantining is somewhat of a self-reported, I may have been in contact, showing no symptoms, isolation is may have some symptoms or may have been in contact with someone who's positive, and obviously positive as you have tested positive. Next one. This is the data point as of now we have on the student data population. Uh, important to remember the student data is reported on a self-reported basis by our families. Um, it's not something that we are forcing or collecting from every uh, student member, but we generally are getting this information through the staffing at the schools from the nurses if they're seeing the symptoms or they're getting that information from the attendance lines. And that information is all getting collected, collated and combined to come up an easy dashboard which will obviously all get onto the website. So those would be the sort of the three big data points which are coming in. Tri-County Health data, the four quadrants, district staff cases and the student staff numbers. Is there a next slide? 
And ultimately, once we have enough data on the student and the staff side, we're still starting the collection process. You generally want to get a 14-day run rate on that data point. You want to be able to norm that data. You want to make sure that it is trending in an up and down before you assign a score to it, as Tricounty has been collecting it for a while. So their data is easy to trend. But ultimately, we want to be able to publish one file number. You know, if, if you didn't want to go through the details, you don't want to see six charts, I just want to see one number. We hope this one number establishes that for the, the community and the students and the parents and the staff. That would be the final number, but that is approximately, as Dr. Tucker was saying, probably around Labor Day when we have enough data and we want to see the spikes after that to be able to start trending it. I think that's the last. Oh. Finally, the research which just got, went into all of this stuff. Um, there's probably a ton more of it. We just we just put in the top sort of big thing. Tri County Health data is is precious and all of this stuff, and they have it sliced for Douglas County, which is really helpful for us to be able to show the entire sort of community health, if you may. And then our staff's um, data is obviously critical in this. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Sethi, and as um, Dr. Tucker is. Doing the transition with cleaning directors, um, questions about this overview, and, and please know that the dashboard will talk in more detail uh, later on. But in terms of this multi-approach, multi-faceted approach to bringing in metrics and then coming up with a number that helps us formulaically make decisions, are there questions regarding the concept of that? Director, no. I, Mr. Sethi, I do have, in terms, I, I do agree with Dr. Tucker, I, and you know, we have advocated for this as well, but collecting our district data is, is to me definitely a, um, a, an extreme positive of how we're doing business regarding this. What I'm wondering is, is there a way we cannot, and I know this, is, is there a way we can actually look at number of cohorts that are quarantined, for instance, because I think you know, when you look at a two, you know, two one hundredth of a percent or whatever, or two tenth of a percent, that speaks one message. But if we have a school where they have several of their cohorts that are under quarantine because they've been exposed, I think that's important information for us to watch and monitor as well. Because this may be a little misleading, because we kind of get lost in sixty-eight thousand kids with these percentages. So I'm wondering about if there's a way to drill down to number of schools who have to quarantine their cohorts. Um, and we know we've got guidelines about outbreaks in terms of it takes this many classrooms to can be considered an outbreak in a school. So I guess those are two pieces of data I'm wondering about, cohort quarantine and outbreak uh, data. Uh, yes, Director Ray, uh, two very important pieces of data among others that we are tracking. Uh, Lisa Cantor in our nursing services department is uh, keeping track of that data and I want uh, the board to know and our folks who are viewing tonight, we're keeping uh, that data very, very secure. We're not uh, you know, releasing any student specific data. So you'll see some of these numbers here um, in the aggregate. You'll, we'll also report by the school uh, that's being cohorted, uh, elementary, middle and high, all three levels. So we have been tracking that data for, for quite some time. I think, I think that's great, because I think we can tend to be alarmist. You know, we hear the little cross team had to quarantine. Oh my gosh, we need to shut the district down. You know, it's sometimes the reaction. So I think if we can, you know, have that transparency to say, you know, if we put it in perspective, to say this is one school, one school is having this kind of issue, this school has certain precautions they're putting in place to hopefully reverse that issue. I think that helps with the alarmists yeah. who say, oh my gosh, we should be doing online right away. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, we, we're tracking that information and different guidances have come within the last week or so about what to do when it's time to quarantine, what to do when it's time to isolate. So those uh, types of things are changing. And uh, we're staying on top of it. And I, again, want to thank uh, Nancy Ingalls and Lisa Cantor and the entire nursing staff for their collaborative relationship with Tri-County. Speaking of Tri-County and how things are changing, as I said, we talked a little bit, uh, a couple of our uh, callers, and I certainly appreciate them uh, raising the issue when I used the term whether it was legal to open. We now have Melissa Sager, who is the attorney 
uh, for Tri-County Health to help us sift through this because, uh, again, um, early on when we were trying to get guidance about uh, who ultimately makes that decision and whether certain openings or closings are legal, uh, it's been uh, on the shoulders of Tri-County. So I'm going to ask the attorneys to uh, speak on that. And uh, Melissa, we certainly want to thank you uh, for joining us tonight. Dr. Tucker, uh, thank you for having me. Honestly, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, first, I'll just quickly say I am not the attorney for Tri-County, but I am an attorney that works at Tri-County. Um, and I am happy to provide a little bit of guidance and updates on uh, what we're seeing first. Um, just to thank you, Dr. Tucker, I know you asked uh, your community for patients, uh, but we appreciate your patients. Things are changing rapidly. Uh, we are trying to be as responsive as possible to the feedback that we receive from our school communities um, and, you know, really just trying to adapt new information as it becomes available. So uh, we appreciate you having us here tonight and just always being available to have these conversations. Um, the Metro Denver Partnership for Health is putting together a bit of guidance on metrics like you discussed here tonight. That will be available tomorrow. We'll make sure you're connected with that information. It'll just uh, be guidance to guide uh, in the reopening and closing if necessary of certain activities um, and additional information on how we can partner. Um, and you know, we have had a very strong partnership with uh, the Douglas County School District. Uh, you mentioned Lisa Cantor or yourself, Dr. Tucker, um, or the variety of school leadership at the um, uh, within the school district, and it's been great working with you. Um, you mentioned guidelines from the state. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, the guidance that we've received from the Department of Education and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment are guidelines to assist in compliance uh, with uh, reopening standards. Uh, they're intended to be flexible um, to allow school communities to really implement uh, those provisions that work best for their community, um, that allow uh, flexibility based on space and activities that happen within establishments. So they really were intended to be broad. Um, Tri-County along with the school district and really in partnership with the school district We'll be monitoring data closely. Uh, we are prepared and connected so that we can meet regularly. Uh, should numbers go up, we're prepared to discuss what that looks like um, as you've outlined here in this presentation, um, but just making sure that we're connected closely. Um, and that's been uh, fairly easy with the, with the school district. And uh, finally, I really just wanted to touch on violations. Um, you mentioned earlier, um, the health department is monitoring for compliance, making sure uh, our schools are staying safe. Um, in addition to communicating directly with school leadership, we are available, um, our call center is available to take uh, complaints or concerns uh, related to reopening. And with those, um, you can, anyone can reach out and is encouraged to reach out through our call center. Uh, that can be reached at 303-220-9200 or call center at tchd.org. And we have staff really ready to take information and our response is really focused on education. We've had a lot of success uh, focusing on connecting um, uh, folks with resources, education about mask wearing, um, breaking down barriers. Maybe someone doesn't have access to masks uh, making sure that we can make those connections, um, just following up with any kind of information that would help uh, the school community, whether it be template communications, drafts, uh, template signage, um, any kind of resources that would help uh, gain compliance with um, masking or any of the other uh, requirements under public health orders. So um, to work with, uh, again, the school district leadership, but also the community as a whole. Uh, we encourage you to reach out. Um, we learn from you as, as this information becomes available, and we uh, are, are partnering on that and connecting you with that information. Um, we're collecting your feedback on that, again, so we can adjust and be as uh, responsive as possible. So 
Uh, with that, Dr. Tucker, I'll turn it back over to you, but I'm happy to answer any questions or touch on anything that I didn't touch on. Uh, yes, I certainly want to thank you and all the fine folks uh, at Tri-County for your, you know, tireless efforts to uh, help serve school districts along the front range, uh, particularly the Douglas County School District. And uh, as things continue to change in terms of what could be a violation or what's legal and what's not legal, uh, please uh, continue to stay in touch uh, with us uh, so that uh, we can efficiently operate our schools. Absolutely, and I'll just quickly mention a great resource is our school support page on the Tri-County Health Department's website, tchd.org. You can check the coronavirus updates at the top, and we have a school support page where we're constantly updating the most uh, available guidance um, and resources. So um, the school community, everyone's welcome to check that out and see what the latest information is. And that would also include guidance in terms of whether we can open, uh, close, or any hybrid opening or closing in between, correct? Absolutely. And just again, a lot of it is guidance. So there's yeah. built in flexibility there. Um, and just because I just remembered, we do expect an updated public health order um, either tomorrow or Thursday. The current Safer at Home order expires on Thursday. Um, we do expect some adjustments in there and some additional guidance documents, which may include uh, an FAQ on mask wearing in schools specifically. Um, based on the feedback that we've been hearing from you, uh, we really take that back to the state and, and try to advocate on behalf of our schools. And we let them know that some of these guidance materials are really critical. And so um, it's good to hear what's needed, where the gaps are um, from all of you so that we can advocate for that at the state. But we do expect some additional guidance this week. Yeah, and I guess the last thing uh, would be a demarcation between mandates like here in Douglas County, mask wearing is a mandate, I think, for 10-year-olds and older, and obviously school districts and establishments can go over and beyond that. But again, a demarcation between what's a mandate, what's law and what's required versus guidance will certainly help us out uh, and will go a long way. I'll take that back. Thank you. And thanks Absolutely. for having me. Sure. Uh, Melissa, do you have any other questions that any of our directors may have? You have any more time? Absolutely. I'm happy to take questions. Sure. Great. Well, just to echo, first of all, Dr. Tucker, Ms. Sager, thank you for joining us tonight and, and supporting us. And the partnership just means a lot to us. I do have a question. Um, I know that Protect Our Neighbor, I was just having a conversation with our commissioners uh, today, and there's some real frustration that that Protect Our Neighbor status is next to impossible to achieve. Uh, one of the concerns was that it requires that all the hospitals that serve Douglas County citizens have to write letters or memorandums of understanding, as well as our law enforcement agency has to agree to enforce the mask uh, mandate. And also there's a whole section, I believe, on enlarging the flu vaccination uh, movement as well. So I'm just curious from your perspective, do you think it's reasonable for our county to achieve that? And I'm, and I'm also speaking that the commissioners appear that, uh, that they don't feel like that it is. Um, so I'm just wondering about your perspective regarding the requirements and the hurdles we have to jump to get to that status. Absolutely. Um, Protect Our Neighbors was definitely designed to be a little more difficult to achieve than a variance, for instance, like we've seen in the past. And you mentioned a few of those uh, law enforcement um, sign on, um, hospital sign-on. Uh, it does ask for that regional hospital sign-on. I will say that our hospitals are very well connected, and we do not think that uh, the county will be responsible for getting a sign-on letter from each individual hospital, um, but we are talking to our hospitals and our county commissioners about that, so um, more to come on that, but we don't think that that should be a barrier um, some of these other issues, um, we're really happy to collaborate and we have started some of the work. Uh, you mentioned flu vaccine. Uh, the Tri-County Health Department's Business Reopening Task Force is working closely uh, with our businesses um, to increase flu vaccination rates. 
and our staff that traditionally provides vaccinations are working very hard in the community um, to get those vaccinations up and increase our education. Uh, the point uh, with flu vaccination being um, if we can decrease the number of folks in the hospitals uh, related to flu, that means our hospital capacities aren't burdened with that uh, while also trying to respond to COVID-19. So uh, we have vaccination for the flu and we're trying to get uh, the word out and really encourage folks um, to get their vaccination. Um, it is free in many, many circumstances. And if folks don't have insurance, they're always welcome to um, access those vaccinations through the Tri-County Health Department. So we encourage them to reach out. Um, and law enforcement, in, in our experience, has been uh, very open to having those conversations. Um, we don't believe it has to be strict enforcement, like um, a ticket writing for all mask wearing. It's more of a partnership and communication plan. Uh, law enforcement knows what the rules are and based on their capacity, what they can contribute to increased compliance. So it's it's not this, it's not uh, super strict as far as what all of these requirements are. And we are really uh, working with uh, the state county commissioners um, and, and partners to move that forward. And we, we do think that it is a possibility, so. Directors, any other questions for Ms. Seeger? Director Lung and then Director Meek. Well, um, recently a news report from uh, American Academy of uh, Pediatrics looked a 90% increase in uh, pediatrics cases from July 9 to uh, August 6. That's 90% increase. And during the last two weeks of July alone, more than 97,000 children test positive. And um, CDC also said that um, Although the children um, case is not as significant compared with their populations, it could be because that tracking COVID-19 cases in children has been difficult due to lack of widespread testing in children and the prioritizations of testing is mainly for adult. So given what CDC and um, um, AAP said, how can we um, safely determine or what is the effective method for us to determine um, when will our students are at risk of having a COVID-19 because testing for them is not a priority and um, they a lot of times experience asymptomatic um, respond and so they could be among, a, a lot of them maybe have, you know, the sim, uh, uh, maybe a, a carrier of COVID-19, but we won't know. I mean, how can we protect their family at the same time protect the teachers in the building? It's really such a fantastic question. And I wish I was the person to answer this. As Dr. Tucker mentioned, our executive director, uh, Dr. Douglas wasn't available this evening, um, but I am. I jotted this question down and I am going to take it back to the team and I'm happy to bring that information back. I will say um, we are monitoring all of this new information. It really is why um, guidance is updated regularly um, and changes and we are doing our, our best to to stay on top of that and adjust accordingly. Um, you know, this is this is a question on everyone's minds. And I think we're we're taking the best approaches that we can with the information that we have um, to keep folks safe um, while uh, you know allowing our, our kids to get back to school, which we know is so important for so many reasons. But um, you're absolutely right. And and um, I'm happy to take this back to the team and, and bring back more information to the board. Very good. Director Meek, you had a question? I'm very appreciative of the partnership with Tri-County Health, and it sounds like we're working with the county commissioners as well. This question might be more for Dr. Tucker, but it sounded like there's conversations about a variance that we may be working with the commissioners, or you said something about a variance, and I wasn't sure no, Melissa actually said something about a variance okay. because they've 
made, and I don't think this was done on purpose, uh, protect our neighbor more difficult. So if you achieve protect your neighbor, you would need a variance uh, for that. And as I said, uh, Douglas County is getting very, very close to uh, protect our neighbor status. We're just a little bit off from that. All right. One quick follow up. And then I think it's, it's great that we're all working together. I think anything we can do to help explain to the public who they should go to <laughs> for various questions, like should they go to Tri-County Health for certain questions? Should they go to the district or should they go to the principal? And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the more clarity we can get on the website with the dashboard and where we can direct people to, the better. You're absolutely right, especially given the fact that we are a one county school district. And I, I know from time to time, our board of directors sometimes uh, will get questions uh, that pertain to the city or county. And some of our county officials, uh, particularly our board of uh, county uh, uh, board of Directors will get questions as well related to school quite a bit, and that's why you're right, uh, Director Meek, that all of us as, a villi uh, as villagers in the village need to work together uh, to help address some cons uh, these concerns, especially during these unusual times. Very good. We don't want to keep Ms. Seeger long because we know you are uh, a very busy person. I just will put a uh, shameless plug in Ms. Seeger. I sent you an email yesterday and uh, would love to hear from you. It's on a whole different topic about an interpretation of some of the uh, legal ramifications. So uh, I'll just put that plug because I know your mailbox is full. So maybe you'll see David Ray and take a look. Um, I, I also appreciate want to, it. I need the follow up. So thank you. Uh, you betcha. <laughs> you betcha. Um, and I also want to just emphasize, Dr. Tucker, and I think you would want this as well, is that we the, the district does not decide whether we're stay at home, whether we're safer at home, whether we're protect our neighbor. And I think that's important for our community to understand is that we have, we're, we're at the mercy of really um, this moving forward by our county commissioners that is supported by Tri-County Health. And then the Colorado Department of Public Health is the one that actually grants the approval for uh, protect our neighbor. So it goes through several different layers um, and, and, and we're at the mercy of those agencies in terms of whether they pursue that uh, categorization and whether or not they're successful with all the things that are required. So I just wanted to emphasize that as well. Um, did I describe that, Mrs. Seeger? Is that correct? I mean, Tri-County Health can't decide the status either. It has to be Colorado Department of Health that actually looks over the documents that you guys, through with the commissioners, provide before that, that risk level is changed. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Ms. Sieg, we're going to let you go. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. And again, we appreciate your time tonight with us. Thanks so much. Have a good night. You too. Dr. Tucker, so go ahead. Yes, I have a few other things that I know uh, the board would like for me to discuss. I shall be mercifully uh, brief in covering those things, but they are very important uh, very items. One, uh, I want to talk a little bit about parent support and resources. Again, these days and weeks are running together. It seems like it was yesterday. <laughs> uh, we had a town hall meeting uh, relative to supporting our parents and supporting our uh, uh, staff uh, and, and uh, ostensibly our students on their return back to school. I'm going to ask uh, Mrs. Ingalls to please our director, executive director of personalized learning services to come forward and give us a quick update on how that uh, town hall went and some additional services uh, we are providing to support our parents. And uh, I know that's something that's near and dear to our entire school community. Very good. Thank you. I don't think so. Is that on, Mrs. Ingalls? Turning it on would help. Thank you. <laughs> there, that works. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. <laughs> Good evening. Um, Director Meek asked about where parents can go for questions, and, and I did want to point out that our school leaders and our school nurses are always available and willing to answer questions related to health and safety. And we'll work with Mrs. Rader to make sure that the public information that we have related to health and safety has some information and visual about where parents can go for questions. 
As Dr. Tucker stated, we had the town hall meeting on, I believe, the 5th of August, um, where many questions were presented, uh, and we were able to discuss some of these questions related to the return to school, and um, we had an FAQ document. Was that posted yet? If it's not posted yet, we'll work to make sure that that FAQ document is posted that included questions that we didn't have time to get to during the town hall. On our public website, our district website, we do have the Road to Return page. And on that page, on the left-hand side, you'll find a Resources for Families link. On that page, the Resources for Families link, there are many resources for parents um, organized into categories. You'll see community resources, learning resources, and many mental health resources. Our school counselors also are an important support for our families. School counselors will continue to meet with families like they did in the spring and provide regular communication and updates to their school communities. And this fall, our school counselors are all utilizing a template presentation that they will customize for their school communities to provide parents a presentation on mental health preparedness for the 2021 school year. We will be planning many parent education events and making sure that we're sharing information about webinars and po podcasts that experts in the area are um, publishing for parents. And um, I mentioned earlier the Resources for Families page on the Road to Return page on the, on the website. There are many uh, resources listed there for parents related to at-home learning. So those are just some examples of many of the resources that we have available at this time. Very good. Thank you, Mrs. Ingalls. All right, Dr. Tucker, any more? You have another topic. I know we've got staff support, um, especially around child care, COVID crisis team, uh, the other two topics on your updates. Uh, yes, sir, and we're right on, I'm watching the clock, we're, <laughs> we're right there, we're right there. Uh, well, certainly, uh, we'll be ready to take any questions that the board has. Let's talk about staff support, and I'm also gonna say parent support. I, I certainly wanna give our community uh, health experts a huge round of applause for supporting and offering to support uh, our parents and students during this time. So I, I cannot really emphasize how great that's been uh, and a free resource for our parents. But also we've added uh, a great deal of supports for our teachers and we're continuing to do that. One of the things I'm really excited about for our teaching staff as well as our parents is the expansion of base. Uh, we know that our parents and our teaching staff are very much um, you know, challenged by uh, having uh, child care and the need of child care, particularly uh, in this uh, hybrid model where parents are and, and are, you know, many of our parents are two-parent working homes. They have to go to work. They're, they're challenged, especially if they have an elementary uh, level child. And so we want to uh, help our staff out and our community about uh, with expanding base and expanding base. And folks, I want to be very clear, we're not talking about taking up uh, a whole lot of uh, class space, a whole lot of building space. Uh, uh, thus uh, causing greater problems with the spread of COVID, but being very strategic in utilizing extra space and having that balance between utilizing space and buildings to address educational needs uh, for our parents, as well as our parents' uh, children, as well as our staff uh, folks, uh, children as well. And so uh, we're gonna make sure we maintain that balance uh, that we utilize appropriate uh, classroom space or building space in those rooms. Uh, one thing that I'm excited about the work that uh, Mr. Knight uh, and Mrs. Ingalls and uh, I think Mrs. Thompson and other folks uh, have really worked on, that is to um, work with a community partner, one of our partners in the uh, social services area to provide funding to expand uh, learning pods or to create, I should say, create learning pods and uh, hopefully uh, uh, bring additional funds for our base program to help alleviate some of the problems 
that staff members are having with child care as well as community members. So we're working hard on that. And again, uh, the district here has done a yeoman's job of marshalling all of its resources. Uh, anything we can do to support our students and our parents, uh, we're gonna do it here in the, in the district. But again, being mindful not to um, overburden or, or not to overpopulate our schools as we are um, you know, under Safer at Home. So I wanna make sure that our board members understand this as well as our community members. And again, uh, hats off to our community partners and the work uh, that uh, Ted and other cabinet members have done to try to bring those resources in. Any questions about, specific questions about that? Director Long? Well, again, thank you very much, you know, Dr. Ka and, and your staff. You know, you guys did a outstanding jobs. You know, uh, this is an unprecedented crisis. Um, so thank you very much sure. for your work. Um, for the parents and, uh, and, uh, and the staff support, many of our district um, staff are also parents for our yes. school district. And um, when we consider, you know, child care, um, what we're going to do for the uh, staff that um, that have kids enrolled in another school district that's doing 100% online, are we able to help them um, enroll their kid into base camp, or base camp is only reserved to a Dallas County school district um, as, as, as student? And also, um, it, it is rather. I mean, our principal is awesome, and many of them try their best and provide some sort of um, care, you know, for um, the people that work for them. Um, is space camp their only options that they can use, or uh, if they have some um, other creative way and is legally um, possible, will will they just will talk to you and then get approval so that they can provide some uh, out-of-the-box solutions uh, for their staff. Yeah. As I said in a memo to our principals, I salute their compassion. I salute uh, not only the compassion and concern and creativity of our building uh, leadership, but also of the district leadership to meet the needs, all types of needs, the educational, affective, as well as the uh, academic needs of all of our students here in the district. So any idea uh, any ideas that our leaders have, that our classroom teachers and support staff members have that can help alleviate concerns that our folks have, we're certainly uh, willing to listen. But we want to make sure that these ideas are within the confounds of uh, legal guidelines. And I'll give you an, an example. Uh, if we are expanding our base program, we want to make sure that it's at a location that's already been approved to provide supervision. If uh, the program is using CARES dollars, for example, we are fortunate to have some federal dollars. We need to make sure that we uh, meet the mandates of those CARES dollars as well. I will ask um, uh, Kate uh, Kataska, our CFO, to come forward and talk a little bit uh, about some of these guidelines and what does this mean for BASE. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. Um, so in terms of the guidelines for the use of CARES funding uh, in support of BASE, it is something that could be feasible. We need to be really careful about the messaging on using any type of taxpayer dollars for what is child care. So um, to the point that Dr. Tucker made about working with our partners uh, in human services, that's where we're exploring some outside funding sources to be able to expand within our existing programs, but still meet the guidelines of those, those sources. Um, he mentioned uh, licensing being, being probably that biggest hurdle, and that is part of that partnership with uh, our, our human services partners is to try to fast track some of that licensing to make seats available as quickly as we can. The other thing to keep in mind is um, we need to make sure that we're supporting our entire community. So making sure that we are 
providing that open opportunity and that equitable opportunity to both the families within our community who have used BASE for a very long time, as well as our staff and recognizing the needs that we have there. Um, so really, as I mentioned, our, our best effort right now is just getting as many seats as we possibly can open and ready to go. A question, Dr. Tucker. So I, um, I do really appreciate the work that's being done to and trying to find solutions. And um, I know you and I have had some good exchange of ideas as far as these academic learning pods that yes, we've sir. seen in Adams 12 yes. and, and really looking at some of the legal parameters around that. But I wonder with, with, with staff though, it seems to me an, an easy, simple solution, no cost to the district, is simply to allow our staff kids to go to school in both cohorts. That they would go to school four days a week. Um, as opposed to us trying to find you know, an independent, licensure kind of program, it, it seems to me that that would be an easy solution. I'm just curious, has staff explored that? I know we had several principals that had suggested that, but I'm just curious, have we, have we explored that option that's no cost and it just simply means our students, that our staff kids show up four days a week? Yeah, and Director Ray, thank you for mentioning that. We have explored every possibility that you can imagine uh, one of the things we've certainly used um, as, as our uh, guide is the issue of equity and ensuring in our hybrid model that every student, each one of our, our 52,000 plus neighborhood school students have an equitable opportunity regardless of what household uh, they come uh, out of, that they have an equitable opportunity uh, for the same and level of education. We also uh, uh, have to balance that with our numbers. Again, uh, in having a hybrid model, we go back to our chart here that the board is going to uh, talk about a little later, is to ensure that we're at 50% capacity or less. And so if we can do any of this stuff, this great idea that you presented, and maintain that level, absolutely, and also keep equity at the forefront. That's why we're really pursuing uh, these educational uh, pods, these learning pods, and, and during the off hybrid days, both staff members, students, and community members, students can attend school while we're maintaining that 50% or less capacity. I think, and I want folks to uh, follow me on this one, we have about 6,000 students who are e-learners. That has dropped the number of students in the hybrid model as well. And we think, and you heard a couple Saturdays ago from our building principals, they feel very confident that uh, with the numbers where we are now and dropping, they certainly can educate uh, a building of students at a 50% capacity. So to answer your question, we're exploring all those, but looking with an eye towards uh, equity and keeping our buildings uh, at a lower capacity to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Really appreciate the, the equity and, and, and really making sure that we're supporting that. It just seems to me with, if you mentioned that it looks pretty favorable that we'll be able to do in-person learning after Labor Day yeah. with, our, with our elementary kids. Yes. And just knowing that we've turned our staff's um, lives pretty much upside down in terms of working differently, as well as those staff members who have relied on having the school to have their kids at. It just seems to me we're, we may be missing an opportunity. Uh, one, to provide a benefit to our staff, um, recognizing that we've turned their lives upside down. But I think it's also an opportunity. We have a small group of kids, possibly, that we can really monitor and say, what happens if we have the staff kids four days a week, as we're looking towards pivoting to fully in-person learning, we've got a great group of kids we can look at and say, yeah, it's working. Uh, even though that they're in both cohorts, we haven't seen an increase of transmission of, of the disease or we haven't seen more quarantine cases. So it just seems to me it's a simple solution that's no cost, also benefits us to kind of study a small control group of kids to get us closer 
to moving to 100% learning uh, when that time comes. So I just I would just throw that out as as, as an advocacy. I, I appreciate the equity question though, because I realize it's it's hard to say this group of kids get this privilege. Um, but I think we're, if we do it for the right reasons to really help us move yeah. towards 100% in-person learning, it would there would be a real benefit in us doing that. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll put that out there. And I don't know if other directors want to comment um, on that notion, uh, but I do appreciate yeah. that we're working hard to figure that out for yeah. our staff. Yeah. And I, I know that we get a lot of emails, and I think Director Lung let it off, yeah. certainly with, um, you know, there, there's a lot of stress. Oh, right now in our staff and um, you know we need to take care of our, our employees as best we can and and I'd rather talk to an angry community and explain to them why we're taking care of our staff um, than to have our staff not be able to do their jobs because they have these these child care yeah. issues so. I, and I, I totally agree with you uh, but I don't want to not underscore the fact that uh, I have people uh, behind me and I have people in our buildings uh, and throughout the district who are working extremely hard, uh, especially uh, Kate Kataska, who's just joined us and, and uh, feels like she's been with our family forever. Uh, they're working hard to provide other equitable opportunities for staff and community members, children to be taken care of during this time. Uh, and again, I know uh, uh, Nancy and Ted have been working for what seems like a month with one of our social services providers to provide free services for staff members, students, as well as for uh, community members, parents, right in our building. Very similar uh, director rate to what you just said. And, um, and the foundation uh, with Ashley Summers have simply been uh, heroic. Uh, we requested $54,000 to offset the registration fees for both staff members, children, as well as uh, uh, children of our parents in the community. So uh, our folks are working hard with staying up. I'm staying up at, uh, <laughs> uh, at night and um, we're, gonna, we're gonna work through this. But I am very hopeful again, come after Labor Day, uh, our cut points uh, continue to improve and that we can start to bring our kids back five days a week. We know it's gonna be a challenge, but it's the right thing to do. So we'll continue to look at those numbers. I know the hundreds, if not thousands of folks who are viewing right, right now, we're gonna, we'll make sure that we uh, keep our word to that, but I really believe that those numbers are lower. We can uh, begin to bring back our K-5, K-6 students, and um, this will greatly reduce the need for our parents and staff members to have their children uh, in a learning environment uh, every day. Director Hansen, I know you had uh, a comment or a question. Thank you. I was trying to save this until we were in the, the portion of the meeting about the dashboard specifically, but I feel like this ties into childcare at this point. I am very confused with the idea that we could possibly bring back elementary students and elementary students are primarily who is being impacted um, with the childcare um, teachers with elementary students. I don't see anything on the dashboard and I don't see any distinctions for elementary and secondary. And so um, I'm just, I'm, I'm just hearing of the possibility of bringing elementary students back after Labor Day. And I just want a little more information about what that would look like and what we would be looking for and how that fits into the presented dashboard to make sure that I can get all of my questions answered about child care. Yeah, very good. I don't know, Director Ray, if you want me to start answering now. Well, let's, or yeah, we let's, 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 if, we, if we might, Dr. Tucker, sure. um, I would suggest we take a break because we've been here for, for a while. And then um, I know we have the budget update next, but I would suggest that we go right into the dashboard agenda yeah. item and we yeah. can lead off with Director yeah. Hansen's question sure. regarding how to clarify yeah. that stipulation between elementary and secondary. Sure. Uh, director. Do we have time for like the hybrid model and the edge annuity to ask questions about that? 
Yes, so let's do that. If we can take a break, sure. we're gonna come back and then we will entertain board's yep. questions around the hybrid model. Director Hansen, if it's okay, if we can hold on to your question for when we hit the dashboard, uh, but we'll finish out with the uh, superintendent report topics when we come back from break. Okay, and I'll be done in two minutes when we come back with the last topic. <laughs> well, we're the ones that are causing the time okay, delay because gotcha. we're asking Thank the you. questions. Sure, so we appreciate absolutely. Dr. Tucker absolutely. your time. Sure. All right, we'll take a, about a four minute break.
And Dr. Tucker, we still were on superintendent's report, and I think we wanted a couple of other items regarding hybrid. And uh, Director Holtzman, is it, was there another topic besides hybrid we wanted to have addressed in the update? Um, yeah, I just had a question. I know that you already spoke about edgenuity quite a bit, and um, this is really more about um, the operations. So we have our, our e-learning school. So it's really more about the e-learning school, not, not about okay. the curriculum resource. Um, I've just heard, and I think we heard in our public comment tonight, that we have some of our in-person teachers, for instance, in special education, it may also be happening with counselors, I'm not sure, or gifted educators, that are supporting our in-person students, and then they're also supporting our students in the e-learning online option. And so I guess my question is, um, is there another way, is there any other way that we could possibly do that so that the, the teachers who are assigned to e-learning could support those students? And I understand we want to still have a connection with their home school, so maybe I guess what I'm really asking for is if you could kind of talk about the issues or the considerations around that, and for those educators or counselors, if that's the case, who are... Um, who are supporting both students, both at their home in-person school and the online school, how that's working. And if we need to support them in a different way than we are some of our other teachers who are only doing one or the other, right. so. Yeah, I will um, ask Nancy to come and speak directly about uh, if we're actually having dual SPED services because our intent was to uh, do the best we could in assigning a SPED person with our e-learning SPED kids uh, and uh, having an, uh, the other uh, folks will be working directly with our hybrid students. So I'll ask her about that. But also, uh, what I believe to be the crux of the matter uh, is simply it comes down to staffing. Do we have or are we getting the number of adequate staff to uh, uh, volunteer, or, or, or are we assigning staff to e-learning? And it may be, in, in a, we're, at, we're at a situation now where we're going to have to um, voluntarily sign staff to balance those numbers because, again, we're at over 6,000 plus students. And so I'll ask Nancy to address the question. I don't want to misspeak about if we have people who are doing both, because again, our intent is to not have staff members uh, teaching online students as well as in person. So I'll ask her to address those particular unique questions. And then, um, you know, Ted and I obviously worked with principals. We worked with uh, Diane Smith, our e-learning um, guru, who's come uh, to help us assign students with that. And uh, Matt has worked closely with them as well. So I want to make sure that we're giving you the absolute uh, uh, accurate information. Uh, Nancy, can you talk about uh, staff that may be working with both types of learners? For those viewing, this is Nancy Ingalls, our personalized <laughs> learning officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our related service providers like our SLPs, OTs, and mental health providers are serving their caseloads, both hybrid and e-learners. And as we know, those services are intermittent in nature. They can be individual, they can be group. Um, those providers consult with general education teachers and work with parents. And uh, the vast majority of them were very interested in maintaining their caseloads and maintaining those connections with um, their students and their families. With our special education teachers, <clears throat> as you know, or as you can imagine, uh, the division between hybrid students and e-learning students is a very complicated puzzle. And <clears throat> because of the number of people that we had available, uh, we looked at our moderate needs numbers, and we have uh, more than enough staffing than we need to serve both hybrid and e-learners. And rather than separating staffing from the buildings, we 
Uh, school leadership, Mr. Knight, the EDOS, um, our director of special education and I met with all of our principals last week and discussed how complicated this is. And with all of the staffing that we have in schools being more than adequate to serve both groups, the result was to go back and um, educate principals how they can work with their teams to determine how to divide caseloads to serve both. In moderate needs, most of our schools have multiple moderate needs teachers. And the number of e-learners allows for some separation of caseload so you can have most of your teachers serving the hybrid and a half or a full or maybe one and a half teachers serving e-learners. And some teams decided to divide it up that way. There were other teams that were very invested in maintaining their caseloads. And so you might have multiple moderate needs teachers that are doing both. And the nature of services from moderate needs teachers has to do with that specialized instruction. They're delivering the intervention that the students need based on their IEPs. So they are not the primary instructors of the core content. And <clears throat> therefore, their schedule is very complicated, but it's a little different than a classroom teacher who's assigned to teaching responsibilities the entire day. So hopefully that gives sort of a broad overview of moderate needs. SSN was a little bit different. Our center-based programs were a little bit different. The number of e students who selected e-learning <clears throat> from our center-based programs, those numbers were a lot lower. So some of those center-based programs may have only had one or two that selected e-learning. And as we know, those teachers have a team of EAs that they work with. And so some determined that it was very feasible to use that whole team of staff to be able to schedule and work with both. There is a little bit of assignment of e-learners to maybe a special education teacher that's not from their school. And the reason for that is there were some cases where there was excess capacity where one school could help another school and take some of their e-learners. So we have some situations like that. And then finally, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that our e-learner students with IEPs will still have a full e-learning schedule. They will have those general education teachers with e-learners that our special education teachers and related service providers will all be consulting with. Thank you. I mean, it sounds like every effort's being made to actually m continue meeting the needs of all of our students, and I really appreciate that. Um, I guess, you know, my question and, and my encouragement to you is just that if you need additional support for those teachers who may sort of be doing double duty, um, that that would be something that we would want you to bring to us. Um, and then I, I do have a question, just if that's happening in any other roles, like for instance, counselors. Does the e-learning, um, I'm gonna call it a school basically, there's 6,000 students, um, do they have their own counselors or are we still utilizing the counselors from the, the school that the student is enrolled in, the neighborhood home school? Yes, um, in most cases, the counselors from neighborhood schools are serving the e-learners to maintain that connection. And it could be similar to what I described with special education. As we know, in, in secondary, there is a team of counselors. So it could be that they have shifted some responsibilities to free up one counselor to do more of that e-learning. Regarding any assignments specific to the e-learning group, um, I'm not entirely in the loop, and I don't know if Mr. Knight has anything to add regarding counselors. This is Mr. Ted Knight, our assistant superintendent. The only thing that I would add in terms of counselors or anybody that serves in kind of that mental health role is we've actually heard from a student perspective that keeping those, those service providers um, servicing both in-person and e-learning students is advantageous. In fact, I had an email from a parent today begging me to make sure her kid's case manager didn't get changed because that's who she's built the relationship with. And so 
you know, there's no perfect answer to some of these. And when you're talking about the mental health of a student and a relationship that they've built with an adult, and for some kids, a relationship they built with a teacher just instructionally and having that consistency is important. So I, I definitely don't think we're gonna make everybody happy. There are gonna be, sorry, some situations where it is going to be best for the kid for that teacher to service kids in person and e-learning. And there are gonna be other times where it's not best for kids because the teacher just literally can't do both jobs and, and can't do either one of them well. So. We're trying to take each one of those situations um, individually and make the best decisions that we can and trying to do those, getting as much feedback and input as we can um, so that we're making the best systemic decision possible. Thank you for those explanations. I totally understand that these are not easy decisions, but I appreciate that I keep hearing you both say over and over that you're looking at the needs of our students and trying to base your decisions on that, and I appreciate that. Just as a follow-up, Mrs. Ingalls, so our public commenter that we heard tonight that was from, there was a teacher in the special ed, I believe she was with SSN, if, I, if I'm recalling, but can we, just for her sake, what, what would be her process? I mean, you heard the dilemma, the frustration. Um, I assume that she's talked to her special education coordinator. So when you've got a teacher who's feeling like, I can't do this, um, what's the process for that, that individual? The process would, I would encourage uh, a teacher who has those concerns to immediately talk to their principal, talk to their school leaders and share those concerns. And they absolutely can pull in a coordinator, a director, myself, we are all available. And it's a top priority to help people through this challenge. You just mentioned how we're asking people to do things differently. And there are a lot of challenges that come with that. And um, we understand that some people need a lot of support and it's often very helpful for multiple people to put heads together and do some problem solving. Mm -hmm. And so um, we will follow up with that school and make sure that we're addressing those concerns. Very good, thank you. I know Mrs. Director Hansen's uh, had her hand up for an e-learning question. Is there any other special education questions regarding hybrid or e-learning? Um, but there are some e-learning questions, I assume. So I see Director Hanson, Director Meek, but Director Hanson, go ahead and, and let's go into the e-learning uh, category of some of our questions. Go ahead. Thank you. First of all, I just want to tell Ms. Smith that I have heard such wonderful things about the progress that she has made in moving e-learning um, toward being ready to go on Monday. And I, I really just wanted to follow up and see if if she feels like we will be ready to go on Monday, I know that teachers are still working so hard to completely redo their their teaching um, <laughs> their teaching structures, and I know that class lists aren't completely ready to go. And if 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 there is more time needed to be ready to get started with e-learning. I just want to make sure that the opportunity has been provided for, um, for you to share that and to let us know um, what, what exactly you need to be, to be ready to go. So I see Mr. Reynolds coming forward. And do we also have Mrs. Smith on the line as well? I, I am on the line. I'm right here. Oh, hey, Mrs. Smith. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. The woman of the hour with this e-learning <laughs> school of 6,000. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so the question, I, uh, question Director Hansen uh, just posed is readiness. How are you feeling in terms of current status and whether uh, e-learning school is ready to go on Monday? All right. Well, um, you know, I would like to say thank you that, I, that I'm... Uh, really enjoying this challenge. It probably is one of the most challenging um, uh, positions I've, I've had in my very, very long career. Um, we have tried to take um, 6,000 students and schedule them and hire teachers and do things that our principals in typical schools started doing last February. Um, and we are doing it in three weeks. So just to give you a, a sense of the challenge that we've been facing, um, I really would like to commend the unbelievably hard work that all of the people who are supporting this effort are doing. 
um, the technical people, um, the folks working with uh, Infinite Campus and so forth. You want to know if I think that we'll be ready. Well, we will start school. Um, we are still trying to finish uh, getting all of our students scheduled. Um, but, you know, our first couple of days, as you know, um, our teachers will want to and need to be really focusing on building relationships with kids. So they may not be jumping right into deep instruction. And some of our um, technical glitches, you know, may occur. Um, but I believe that we will be ready to connect our students and teachers together. We have been holding um, parent orientations, virtual orientations. And uh, I'd say the other thing that has been so heartwarming is parents also understand the challenge that we're facing. And uh, for the most part have been extremely thankful um, for what we're doing. I mean, this really is a, a community and team effort. Um, and we, everyone is putting their best foot forward. And um, as I constantly say to everyone, um, COVID has taught all of us, if nothing else, flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Smith. And I see Chief Assessment and Data Officer Matt Reynolds at the podium as well. Is there anything you wanted to add to that? I, I think uh, Diane is spot on. Uh, we've put in a tremendous amount of work um, it's pretty crazy to think that we've created a feeder in, in three weeks hmm. um, for 6,000 kids, and uh, we continue to work uh, pretty much uh, seven days a week in getting this thing set uh, for next week uh, to be able to make sure that we're up and running and you know, really focusing on the core courses first, because that's really the priority is to make sure that those students have those. And um, you know, we've gotten our elementary students really ready to go to release those schedules, and we'll be uh, starting to work on uh, getting all of the middle schools and the high schools. We've had our meeting with both the high school uh, principals, registrars, and counselors yesterday, and we've had our meeting with middle school principals, counselors, and registrars today, and we have a lot of work ahead of us over the next three or four days. So it's exciting work, but it's a great opportunity. Very good. Director Hansen, did I answer your question? Yes. All right. I, I just want to reiterate how um, truly impressed that I am. I know that creating a school in three weeks is the equivalent of climbing Mount Everest. And the feedback, the community, the friends that have reached out to me after the orientation meetings has been really positive. So um, if there's anything that you need, I just wanna make sure that you're comfortable reaching out and letting us know so that we can support you in any way possible because you're doing great things. Very good. Director Meek and then Director Long for other e-learning questions. Director Meek. So really Director Hansen asked my question. Okay. So I will just, again, say how much I appreciate all of the hard work. Um, just to give some context, the size of that learning program is bigger than about 80% of school districts in our state. So it's just this monumental task. And poor Dr. Tucker has to hear me say over and over, go slow to go fast. And if, if we need more time, it's, it's fine. But I'm hearing that we are ready to go. And I just want to thank everyone for your hard work. It's pretty amazing. Director Long. Well, I echo what uh, Director Hansen and uh, Director Mick said about you know, the e-learning programs. Um, it, it, it takes a long time to uh, make that right. And um, I appreciate parents um, and teachers' you know, patience in waiting for that. Um, and I think communications is very important. And um, so I, I have people ask me, um, when will um, email um, send to the people enrolled into uh, the e-learning um, a more detailed um, how to implement some of the e-learning uh, staff, for example, you know, picking up the laptops, you know, how to pin the world book, uh, and things like that. And um, also, we, um, I think, ultimately, really want to go back to a five days, you know, learning. That's the ultimate goal. So when a portion of the student um, enrolled into e-learning from that particular school, and are they considered student of the e-learning 
departments, or they still consider student of um, the particular school that they are from. And how about a teacher that being assigned to teach in uh, e-learning? So does the principal has any say on their assignment? So ultimately, the question is um, um, equitability. Okay, we, we want to make sure that all the students or all the staff that belongs to a particular school, when we all go back to five days learning, they all are on the same page and they, you know, going back to their own way of, uh, of learning because a different school may have a little bit something, you know, different. So now you have a portion of the teacher, a portion of the student are on e-learning and the rest of them are in hybrid. I just want to make sure that um, when they all come back to a five days um, in-person learning or in the off chance that they all go to a uh, e-learning 100% for everybody, they are all have the same equitability, I mean, uh, same level of education. And then also principal assignment, um, are they belongs to that particular school or are they now quaff to that 6,000 uh, student you know, e-learning school? So as usual, Director Long punched in a bunch of those, bunch of questions yes, yes. in that. So I don't know, Mr. Reynolds or Mrs. Smith, which whichever would like to address some of those. I heard certainly one of the questions being uh, whether or not how, how teachers are assigned to e-learning. I also heard um, another question around the, uh, I think almost whether that student is an e-learning student or whether it's a neighborhood student, if, if that's, if there's a differentiation. So uh, Mr. Reynolds or Mr. Smith, Mr. Reynolds, I think is ready, Mrs. Smith, and then uh, uh, you can jump in as well after he responds. Go ahead, Mr. Reynolds. Perfect, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so that was part of our great puzzle um, that we had to work with in our constraints. Um, our goal was to keep the kids assigned to their school and create a secondary line of enrollment for this e-learning. So we wanted to keep the, the kids as close to their nexus, which is the school, as possible. And that included when we built the sections, we started school, feeder, region, district. We did a bullseye. And we wanted to keep those kids and the staff closely aligned to the students from that particular school. That was our goal. Um, as you could imagine with the permutations of trying to put that together, it was really difficult to do that in every case uh, because you could have an imbalance of students from one school requesting it and not from another. Um, so their primary line of enrollment is staying with their school. Uh, the secondary line of enrollment um, is this e-learning and that's how we built the school, which is another complexity. So we really didn't create a new feeder. It's creating a full feeder within our existing feeder system. So their primary line of enrollment stayed with their existing school. I think the other question that was um, in there was about guaranteed curriculum. And Mrs. Smith, you may want to jump into that. Sure. Um, in terms of will our e-learners have the same learning uh, exposure as our neighborhood students that are in person? Um, so the reason we chose Edgenuity is because it is standards based and all of our teachers should be teaching in a standards-based um, way. So while the specific lessons that kids might be doing uh, may be different from the uh, lessons that um, they'd be getting in the regular classroom, um, standards are standards, and that's what they'll be teaching. So when you think about um, at the elementary level, you know, addition is addition and multiplication is multiplication. Um, and so, um, we will want our teachers to be following along in the curriculum. And also, you know, what's nice is because we are using Douglas County teachers, they know the order that we teach things um, in the regular school, and they will be paying attention to that. Now, will we have 100% alignment when everyone comes back together? Probably not. I mean, I'm sure that there will be some um, minor adjustments here and there. But when I think about the um, inequalities of the way we were teaching last spring, when we had, and, and now teachers are going to be trying to overcome um, the, the deficits that children probably experienced, some of the children experienced during that time. Um, I think the adjustments that they may, might need to make when we, and I'd like to say when we all get back to 100% in-person learning, um, will be so much smaller. It will be more the type of adjustments teachers are typically used to making when um, a new student moves in, when a new school year begins, um, and, and those types of things. Very good. 
Thank you, Mrs. Smith. All right, directors, we do need to move on um, soon here from the superintendent's update. So unless there's a burning question out there, we will move on to back into the dashboard discussion. I think we're just gonna adjust the agenda unless directors I hear differently from you. But we're gonna dig back into that uh, dashboard and if we could find that graphic and bring that back up. I believe it's slide five. So directors, what questions, so let's delve into this a little more deeply. Um, we were re received an overview in terms of these being the categories. And Dr. Tucker, I, just, I guess I need to hear again. Um, I think you used the term, um, what is best for our community when Correct. it comes to how we respond to each of these risk levels. And I heard you state that currently, our current thinking, it's best for our community to, if we're at safer at home, for us to use the hybrid model. Um, so again, the pivot for you right now is that if we are able to get the protect our neighbor status, and we have that 14 days of sustenance when we're in that status, that's when the district and you as our leader feel we need to pivot. Is that correct? I'm going to, uh, start with a point of uh, clarification here at protect our neighbor status and then we had this conversation the last time that's easy right there that's for me that's easy for us to be in person I think where our numbers are right now and even though we are at safer at home we can start bringing our students back five days a week so I want to make sure I'm very clear on that and I want to go back to this question about, well, what's legal and what's not. As uh, Mrs. Sager stated, a lot of the stuff here has changed. What we were, uh, when I talk about legal, it's whether we're permitted to do it and whether or not the health department will come in and, sh and shut us down as they did with restaurants. So I think we've been able to clear that up. But these are guidelines. They morphed from uh, from my opinion, and I certainly don't want to offend anyone, they morphed from uh, creating a better understanding uh, with our health officials at Tri-County and with the state, and also what are we going to do in terms of if some of these things here are not consistent in your community, will you have someone come and shut us down? And the answer from that has morphed into no, we're going to give you some guidelines to follow. We will follow up. The, the health department will follow up if there are any uh, questions or concerns. But based upon where we are right now, and these are not no longer heavy-handed guidelines, that uh, if our numbers continue to trend down after Labor Day, again, I'm going, when I get home, whether it's midnight or 11 o'clock, I'm going to look at the data uh, uh, score sheet again. And we'll be watching these numbers here. And we'll be watching them after Labor Day to see exactly where we are. We have a lot of, uh, I know uh, Director Hanson will want us to revisit her question of you know, how we're basing this. Well, we operated base the entire summer with our young uh, kids. They wore masks, uh, and we didn't have a single incident over the summer. Of course, that's not a whole school, but it certainly gives us, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Director Ray, it gives us a data set, if you will, and I don't want to reduce kids down to data set, but for simplicity's sake, it gives us a group of students to look at. We also, uh, as you know, are going beyond month two uh, with our younger, older folks at, I uh, shouldn't say older folks when it comes to kids, <laughs> our teenagers, if you will, at DC Oaks. Uh, also, we know at Eagle Academy, those students are coming in person. So we do have a group of students that we can, uh, that we can monitor. So Dr. Tucker, so yeah, so getting into Director Hansen's question then, yes. do we need to delineate then um, conditions that say our elementary kids can come back five days versus our secondary kids? Uh, yes, sir, and I certainly wanna uh, do due diligence in answering uh, Director Hansen's question. This is a draft, this sheet here, Stacy should, well, there's draft to the right. All of this should, uh, you know, 
represent our thinking in draft right now as more guidance and more understanding becomes available. Uh, one of the best things that we have uh, going for us is the recommendation from the board. Let's look very closely as, at what is happening specifically at the, in the Douglas County School District. So that gives us a great point to begin to say, look, we're not seeing these rises in cases, whether, they, uh, whether we're isolating or quarantining a, a feeder pad, a pattern or a school. So that gives us early information to look at, and it's broken down. I don't know, uh, Mr. Seth, that we broke it down on this draft here by elementary, middle, and high yet. There's not enough data yet, but we can. Yeah, right. As the data sets begin to roll in, we'll be able to do just that. Because again, this is orientation, and we're going to get a great deal of data, and we'll talk about that uh, certainly uh, after uh, this beginning on the 24th. So really, we should see more fluidity between these columns, I think is what I'm hearing you say, Dr. Tucker, is there's, there's not this, this rigid border that says the only way we can bring kids back five days a week is if we are in that protect our neighbors Correct. column. There's right. a little more uh, ebbs and flow, if you will, yeah. that you would have to consider um, to make that decision. Absolutely, and if I did not articulate that the way it should have been articulated the last time, I do uh, apologize, but I uh, certainly would not apologize for this. Uh, for example, if you're having uh, an incident rate of 200 or more and students and staff members are developing COVID, why would you have in-person teaching and learning? And I cannot stand here uh, as, your, as your superintendent and say, we're at 10% and we're going uh, full bore. And from my, from my uh, perspective, uh, that's not uh, educationally right. Again, I, I'm not uh, casting judgment on other places that are doing that and have done it, but you know, we work very closely with our health experts and anything that we recommend will be based on the information we've gotten from our health experts. As one of our parents pointed back to uh, June when we stated where we thought we would be. Director Hansen, you have a follow up. Thank you. I just wanna make sure I fully understand what the implementation of this decision dashboard looks like to make sure I ask the right questions right now. Um, if the board approves this dashboard this evening, is board action not required to pivot between 100% at home or the hybrid or 100% in person? And I would interject, and Dr. Tucker, feel free to jump sure. in with me, but I, I, I believe that if we are approving this framework, board directors, we're really giving our superintendent to make that decision knowing that this is the data he's using to make his decision. So our approval of this is that we're approving his process for making the decision. I don't think we would have to have an emergency board meeting every time Correct. that Dr. Tucker wants to come back and pivot to a different learning model. That's my opinion. Um, I don't know if other directors want to weigh in that or Dr. Tucker, if that's your understanding as well, but that's a good question. That is my understanding. In Again, uh, one of the premises of our health experts using a 17 and a 14 day rolling average is to look at the data and for school districts and for, and for businesses to be flexible, uh, in our case, for in-person learning, for hybrid learning and for e-learning. Again, we go back to what our uh, outstanding uh, members of our student advisory group said, we really uh, have believe, and I don't, again, I won't uh, dispute any of this, but I think uh, those are independent, uh, very, very smart students who, who are expressing their feelings. Uh, and I don't think we have a single teacher, support staff, or administrator, or superintendent who's telling kids, well, get ready for e-learning, it's gonna happen. I think they were able to, they were able to express their feelings, and they, they're seeing what's happening across the country in places that were not as methodical as we are in opening up schools. And so, uh, again, uh, things are fluid. They have to change. We're watching the seven day and the 14 day uh, rolling averages. And uh, it would be uh, somewhat time consuming to call a special board meeting. Uh, now, if that's the will of the board, look, I serve the, our, our staff 
our students community, and of course I serve this board here as your loan employee, and if that's your will, then we'll do that, but uh, because this is a uh, something that's uh, it's going to take us to be uh, fluid, flexible, and nimble, then I, I, I don't see uh, why there has to be a, a board meeting every time we get ready to switch, but it speaks to the importance of our board members on our crisis team. You will have two uh, elected board members on our crisis team that will uh, start on September 2nd that will be fully aware of where we are going. And I invite each board member, every person in our school district community, all 370,000 of our citizens, to keep an eye on our dashboard. This dashboard will be on the district's website as well as a catalog of uh, previous uh, 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 metrics and numbers and so forth. Dr. Tucker, what would give you the confidence to pivot our secondary students to full in-person learning? Now that's a huge question uh, there. It certainly, the numbers look good now. Again, if we look at uh, what's happening at um, at DC Oaks, and I, this weekend I was in uh, contact with the leaders of our other, I hate to say alternative, our other high schools, and um, their numbers are looking fine and they're, they're working hard, but I would like to see, before bringing middle and high school students back, I would like to see several weeks of those numbers uh, in that area where we have this positivity rate below Five, below 5% five and we have uh, 25 or below uh, uh, incident rate per 100,000. I would like to see that for a few weeks. National experts state the same thing. This is not just coming from uh, Dr. Douglas, but when we uh, communicate with folks at uh, the Centers for Disease Control, not just the Colorado Department of, uh, of uh, Public Health and, and Environment, but also they would like to see for several weeks uh, that positivity rate uh, below 5% in that incident rate. And uh, Director Ray, you were one of the first to catch this. It used to be 50%. You can go to the Colorado Department uh, of Health and they may, I think they have their incident rate set at 50%, different metrics. But now what is becoming the gold standard is 25 uh, incidents per 100,000. So uh, to answer that question very succinctly, uh, directors, uh, positivity rates several weeks at the high for the high middle school and high school uh, below uh, five percent beautiful where we are right now the incident rate uh, certainly for the high school folks uh, at 25 percent or lower now we're not there yet for everybody we're right at 50 percent but again um, we've done some remarkable things here in our county our voluntary mask wearing rate is at 90 percent director Graziano yeah, my, my uh, two two quick questions. One, yes. I know in the previous uh, draft of this, it was zero to 100, so I, uh, that number now went to 25. And so that's, I, that's correct. So that, if you can explain that. And the other thing I it would be really helpful to explain is walk us through when you, that night you go to bed, at midnight you check the numbers, you show up the next day and it's now we're, we're ready to open up. Right. Tell us what that looks like. Is there a lead time? Is there a period of time that that takes? What does that look like to the district, to parents, to family? Just, you know, share with that what your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. And I've shared uh, my thoughts with many of these uh, really smart people here that we have here in the board, uh, here in the boardroom right now, I'll ask Mr. Sethi to come forward as well. Uh, as I said earlier, when, you, when we change that number from uh, 100 or 50 um, in, incidence rates per 100, we heard from Dr. Douglas and he mentioned and Director Holtzman pointed out that out as well. You know, you're, you're beginning to tick up. You remember several weeks ago, we had begun to tick back up and he stated other numbers are looking good, but he didn't feel quite comfortable with a 100 incident rate. Now across the country, that 25 uh, uh, incident rate per 100,000 is becoming more and more the gold standard. Now, uh, Director Graziano, I will be very interested in seeing what the uh, partnership for the Denver Metro Area Health Group comes out with that uh, should be a dashboard 
uh, for all of the districts in the front range to use. So I'm uh, very excited about doing that. I certainly appreciate suggestions from the board and community members saying, Thomas, look at both the state health uh, department numbers as well as Tri-County. So what does it look like? So we've gone several weeks. We've gone, and, and folks, please don't quote me on this. I'm, uh, again, this is some early thinking right now. We're gone several weeks, three weeks. The numbers have been very low. Our incident rate is down. I will uh, have a conversation with cabinet with all of our principals involved for their input and absolutely with the board and say, you know what, I think here on Monday, I think we need to go, we need to have a go at it. I think we need to go ahead and uh, start bringing our middle and high school students back. Some people have set artificial dates like we're going to come back uh, at the end of the nine weeks or we're going to come back at the end of the semester. And I want to thank this community. I know we haven't gotten a, a lot of uh, praise for that, but I want to really thank this community here for not doing that. I want to thank this community here for not, and we don't get a lot of praise for this either, not that we need it, but I, I think this is a, an appropriate opportunity to say it. We could have, and, and this is no criticism to districts who started out on e-learning, but we didn't. We followed the signs. We had these tough conversations. We've taken the criticism because we care about our 68,000 students here in this district. And the criticism is okay, and we've stuck by our guns here. I would just add, Director Grazio, you know, that 25 is the standard for protect our neighbors. Yeah. That is that is the yes. requirement. When you pursue that status, you have to have that, that metric. Correct. That, I just mentioned it because it was different. The, the yep. prior draft yep. Was, yep. was different. Yep. Director Holtzman, Director Meek, and Director Long. Go ahead, Director Holtzman. Okay, so this is, I think, just more of a clarification. But it, on slides 9 and 10, um, we you all have the current data as much as we have for for Douglas County School District. Um, everything else is Douglas County in general. This is for our school district. And am I right that you are going to kind of look at that data over the next couple of weeks and then make some determination to incorporate it into that um, framework? Isn't that what I think you had zero to one, two to seven, eight to 12 is are you planning to like kind of assign numbers to that and make it a part of it? Or is it just kind of a, we're gonna look at the main stuff and then this will be extra? I, I think ultimately our goal is to provide as much data as possible, both to the community, but to the cabinet leadership. So mm -hmm. it will be part of the overall metric. Okay. The trending of it is what's gonna determine what numbers you put on it. When we look at the tri-county, which was the three slides before this, right. that number has been trending pretty steadily, so we can make a determination of the metrics for that. This information is gonna be new and we'll need about two week period to let it develop. Okay. So for now, we know that you're gonna utilize it in some way and you just kinda of need to see what the trends are and um, utilize judgment and work with public health department to incorporate yeah. that. And that makes sense to me. Um, the other couple questions I had, and I'm not suggesting that they need to be a part of the dashboard, but probably I think you would agree would be a part of the decision making. Um, in terms of, and I guess, I guess what I'm saying is I almost feel like we have to have individual schools somewhere because let's say we have an HVAC problem that isn't able to be fixed um, as quickly as we'd like in a school. That's probably another consideration that you would have as you consider opening, closing, transitioning. So I'm just wondering if there's a place on here somewhere for you know, monitoring ventilation, monitoring um, the provision of hand hygiene materials, because I have every confidence that we are already doing everything we possibly can in all of those areas. Um, for our community, it might be helpful that we acknowledge if we're having a sustained issue somewhere, if we have a supplier problem or something like that. I just kind of wanted to throw that out and then with the idea of looking at individual schools. Yes, good points. I almost wonder, just to follow up with that, if we can parallel the trend data, Mr. Sethi, to similar to what we would do with the county um, metrics. So for instance, they're using 5% positivity. So if we start seeing our 
5% of our students who are quarantined, for instance, or, or tested positive, that might be a benchmark for us to use in your numerical value of trends. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yes, it does. I would just reconfirm that the if we get a positive on our slides, chances are Tri-County also has that a positive. I see. So right. it's a subset of the data. The, what Tri-County doesn't have is the other big data points, which sure. they don't see those when we quarantine or isolate. The health team has told me, and underneath all of this, the detailed data is per person, per individual, per building. So they're tracking it to that level. So we can aggregate it sure. any which way. But the health team is looking at a bunch of things, cohorts, sure. siblings, class metrics in mm -hmm. the group, how they're working. So if there's two kids for the same families in two schools, they're looking at all of the data points to kind of make determinations of individual school-based isolations, quarantining, closing, cleaning, all of those things. Sure. Maybe helpful for us to really identify what really handicaps a school. So for instance, if, if all the leadership is gone because <laughs> they're quarantined, that might have a, weight, a more of a weighted factor in our local data, yeah. or if there is 5% of our student population in that school, that might really be an indicator that, whoa, mm -hmm. you know, the, the upswing is such that we need to really um, look at that as being an outbreak, but it also would impact that data for us as well. Yeah. 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 Uh, Director Meek, then Director Lung. So I love data, and at the same point, I think it gets to be confusing a little bit sometimes to the public. So I just want to make sure I have clarity on the dashboard itself. And I think um, due to some of the questions that we had from public comment as well, it's because some things have changed a little bit. And so just so I'm clear, um, there are mul multiple factors that will each have a rating under like protect our neighbors with that would have its own zero to two rating. The test positivity rate would have its own rating. So each of these factors have their own rating. And what we had said last time was the protect our neighbors would override everything and the safer at school would override everything. But what we have said is that really is not the case correct. moving forward. Uh, that's okay. correct. Because now, again, it gets back to, and I, and I won't mention it again, it gets back to that whole legality question. Right. It's if best for your community, and that's how some school districts around the front range are able to open with uh, positivity rates and incident rates higher than ours and not in protect our neighbor status because I want our folks to understand this. What uh, the new guidance is that if best for your community, that's why they're able right. to open. Um, back to uh, uh, Director Graziano's point in, under uh, in the uh, 25 uh, incident rate per 100,000 being a gold standard as Director Ray mentioned. So it's really easy. Uh, it requires uh, an incident rate of less than 25 uh, per 100,000 unless the test positivity rate is less than 5%, that's where we are right now, in which case um, an incident rate of 50 or less per 100,000. And the reason we're not there is because we are above 50 for the uh, incident rate. We're dropping though, we're dropping. So when all those things are, are met, then uh, Director Graziano will, I certainly feel, and I'm not saying that has to be it because we can go back to if best for our community. Uh, but we feel really good for certain when we get to the, that mark, and we're very close. So I think the other question that came in, uh, both from Director Hansen and from a public comment around the difference between school levels, and so there may be decisions that are made Correct. that look different yes. for elementary versus our secondary. Correct. So I think even having an asterisk that says, you know, due to school characteristics, um, or age levels, there may need to be different decisions made or, or something like that just to indicate that there may be differences um, just to help the public understand that. Uh, very good point. Again, we go back to, you know, if it's best for our community, our school community, uh, you know, we're 
fortunate again, I, when you look at our elementary level we, levels, we see uh, the uh, zero incident rate based upon our conversation uh, with our base, uh, head of our base program of COVID infection over the summer here. But you are right because we heard um, on that Saturday the 30th, I believe, of the different uh, ways our buildings are set up and the different levels of enrollment. And we do have to keep that into consideration as well. Director Long. Good point. Well, again, thank you very much for developing uh, this. Um, I, um, I'm struggling to see what I'm approving, you know, if I vote aye on this. Um, so am I giving you the authority to make additions, when to open school, either five days a week, stay hybrid, or go e-learning, based on your determinations and you have the options of reopening a certain gray and not the others for particular yes. characteristic. And, and what is the notification process to the board on your decisions? Or, 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 or will you going to notify the board your decisions? And um, once you decided based on the data, and the dashboard, when you decided whatever way you want to go. Make this decision, but we're, they're asking for us if, if, if they go through this framework and they collect this data and they make decisions based on this data, can we support that? And, and certainly it also gives us permission to hold our superintendent accountable. So if he says, you know what, we're all gonna go back to in-person learning. I don't care if you know, we have 10% you know, of our population is positive. We then, as his employer, <laughs> would say, stop. Yeah. It's not consistent with the framework that you provided. So we're really approving a, a decision-making framework, not necessarily how the decision will be made, if that makes sense. So can I ask any other questions? Um, in the, your slide number seven and uh, number eight, it both said that the student and uh, the staff is self-reporting. Um, so how, how do we know the data are accurate? And uh, because we are data driven, um, having accurate data is really important, but you, if you're doing a self-reporting, how um, trustworthy those data is, and, and also, there are lag time between when you submit your toolkit for testing and when we, the, the turnaround time, I'm not quite sure how many days right now, but it used to be, you know, eight day, 8.4 day, what I read, you know, in, uh, in, in uh, late July. And how could that factor into, you know, the long delay of reporting the data um, to make a decisions um, on how to reopen the school uh, or, or, or not. Did, did uh, I, I don't think there's any way that Tri-County can identify whoever to get infected in Dallas County and decide whether they're Dallas County student or Dallas County staff. I mean, there's no way they can do that, right? So, so the Tri-County data really, it, it's just um, a figure that we can reference, but how many of those on that particular reporting is actually in our school district. I don't think there is a relationships whatsoever. And also, I would think that large portion of our staff do not live in Dallas County. Am I correct? Yep. And 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 how yep. how will the staff you know that don't live in Dallas <coughs> County factor into you know these equations? Thank you. Well, one I'll say that there is a correlation between the data that we get back regarding test positivity or negativity from Tri-County. I think there's a correlation because when the cases are reported to uh, Lisa Cantor in our nursing department, they are bound, duty bound to report those cases to Tri-County. Tri-County confirms the cases. Now, Let's talk about the, I think what you're really getting at, Director Long, which is a very important point, that's the lag time. 
And that's why we're so uh, gracious, uh, one, that our staff members, uh, and I'm sure you all have been contacted uh, amongst your uh, emails, that we needed streamlined testing. We needed a quick turnaround on testing. And that's why uh, the board is on uh, the agenda. The board has approved our contract with the Gary Foundation. Uh, we should have those results back in 72 hours. And it doesn't matter whether you work in our district or not. If a teacher, our teachers are, will, be getting, will get tested uh, no less uh, than twice, uh, at least twice, I should say at least twice a month. And so, and it doesn't matter uh, where they live geographically. So we're gonna get real uh, quick data. I'll ask uh, Nancy, I know she and Ted have done a tremendous amount of work and um, I know Mary probably should ask Mary Clemish and Mary, we're not asking for any legal advice here, but uh, can you tell us the uh, nuances of the contract and maybe uh, Nancy can give us some nuts and bolts uh, in terms of how we can get that testing and begin to look at who's been quarantined, who's been isolated, and to the big question here that the board has here, uh, you know, which school or which feeder pattern you need to shut down? Uh, Mary, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Um, with respect to the testing, you're right. They've guaranteed 90% uh, of the tests will be turned around in 72 hours. The tests will be available to all school-based staff uh, two times per month and to non-school-based staff once a month. And we're working, in fact, uh, very diligently in hopes that we can get the availability of tests available and out to our staff uh, within hopefully days uh, at very, very soon. So the contract is such that uh, we are, it's the term of the contract lasts through December 31st, a good amount of time, which means that for a school-based staff, they'll have available to them on a voluntary basis, nine tests, whether or not they are experiencing symptoms. So if they wanna have a test, they can go in and um, get the test consistent with the, with the uh, terms that um, uh, COVID Check Colorado, which is uh, affiliated with uh, Gary Community Investments uh, or Gary Investment Community so that we have uh, the data quickly. Um, for those employees who are symptomatic, they can always go into their, their a healthcare provider and get tested as well with no uh, questions asked as well. But this uh, really assures uh, hopefully a prompt turnaround time for all of our employees Very on good. a regular basis. Thank you, Ms. Clemish. Ms. Ingalls, did you have something to add to that? Not much. I think that Mrs. Clemish covered a lot. Um, with the testing through Gary Community Investments, COVID Check Colorado, uh, if there's a positive result, the employee will be notified immediately through an app. Um, mm -hmm. Our processes don't necessarily change. A positive test is a positive test, whether it comes from this testing mm -hmm. site or a healthcare provider or some of our um, community sites that will be in Douglas County that our staff also have access to. And we will work very closely with um, the health department like we currently do to look at contact tracing and they will help advise us who may or may not need to be quarantined. Very good, thank you, Ms. Zingles. I wanna move on to uh, Director Hansen. I think if we can do a final question that I wanna encourage the board for us to move for some action. Go ahead, Director Hansen. Um, thank, first of all, thank you for your patience with my multiple questions on this issue. The distinction between elementary school and secondary school is just really um, throwing me because it's not addressed in the actual um, graph that we've been looking at. I, I'm really hesitant to draw that distinction because we have so many adults in each and every one of our elementary schools that we are also responsible for. And I, I'm just not sure that I, I can get comfortable with this concept of distinguishing between elementary and secondary without having more information. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if what you are proposing is actually when we hit the green zone and are eligible according to the data that you have listed, 
that you would just like to start moving elementary students back to five days a week in person rather than jumping in with the entire district? Or is your recommendation that we consider moving elementary students to five days a week in person even before we hit that green zone and try to, um, to, to push that, I guess. So <laughs> the, the elementary distinction is just really throwing me. So any clarification that you can provide for that before we vote would be very, very helpful. Okay, yes, let me go ahead and um, uh, give this a, a, the, the best shot here I have. Uh, first, I want to uh, clear up. I'm not saying that we need to be in protect our neighbor status in, before we start bringing kids in uh, five days a week. Uh, I, what I did say is that based upon the numbers that we have right now, I feel really confident, uh, and I'll go back to what I said in June, I feel very confident that we can start to bring uh, students back to school, full, uh, back to school full time five days a week even if we do not hit the protect our neighbor status. So I, I wanna be clear, very, very clear in, in making that statement. I also said, as uh, Director Ray pointed out, if we are um, happen to be at stay at home or we have a positivity rate at 10, even if we're not at stay at home, I cannot uh, in good conscience say, okay, let's bring our students back. I think this needs to be very, 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 very fluid. Based upon the advice, uh, Director Hansen, that we've been given in every board meeting since June, we've had uh, a medical expert or some uh, expert from Tri-County or the state uh, that understands this stuff a lot better than we do, uh, give us guidance, and we're gonna continue to do that. Based upon the guidance that we have right now and based upon our experience in the Douglas County School District. And again, I'm not saying I don't want, and, I, and I'm glad you elucidated this question here. I am not saying that after Labor Day, I'm going to say bring elementaries back. I say we're gonna look at the data, and if our numbers continue to trend downward, I will ask that we start bringing our students back, beginning with our elementary level students. Again, I'm basing that on uh, uh, the uh, base uh, camp experience since this summer through now, zero cases, uh, positive cases uh, regarding that, uh, looking at uh, our experience of in-person learning even from our older students and the science that we're reading and more importantly, uh, based upon the recommendation of our experts in the health field. Hopefully that cleared up a little bit. So I'm looking at the dashboard right now, and technically we are still in zone, um, well, I guess the yellow zone, safer at home. And I'm just, <laughs> I'm seeing that under the criteria established by the safer at home decision-making, that we would still be in the hybrid learning. So to be comfortable turning this over and saying that the board will no longer, um, or that, that we will give you the decision-making ability to pivot between these three options, I need it to be clear so that I understand what I'm consenting to. And saying that right now we're in the yellow zone, but possibly we could look at bringing elementary students back five days a week, even though the graph shows that it needs to be in the green area, is really taking away the purpose of this dashboard, which is to create some concrete goals for our community and some concrete parameters for parents and for teachers and building leaders to really understand what what they're going to be working with. Dr. Tucker, so I wonder, just to help us move us forward with that. So it sounds like what Director Hansen is in need of is our local metrics and somehow incorporating our local metrics into this decision-making dashboard. And I know you don't have those. I know God and uh, Mr. Sethi is still uh, pondering as well what those cut scores might be. Um, but it might be something that would be helpful for us you know, that says um, that we have less than 4% of our elementary staff 
who have tested positive. I mean, I, I'm just throwing out you know, an example of a metric, but it sounds like the discomfort that I'm hearing is we don't have the local metric uh, mentioned in this dashboard and wondering if there's a way for us to mention that so that we know that that's going to be referenced uh, as well when those decisions are made. Yes, I, I think we did mention that. We uh, did, what we have not broken down yet is because you don't have the data set. Again, there's, you know, we need to, uh, there's no rush in terms of saying these are the hard, fast numbers right now because we need to build the local data set with students. But I want to go back to this uh, preposition phrase here, if best for your community. And when we see these numbers trending extremely low to protect our neighbors, and this is, again, uh, these data points are not the sole basis for our decision making. There are other things that we need to consider. Uh, do we value uh, having to, uh, the need to, and I'm sure we do in these probably rhetorical questions, the need to make up this COVID gap. Our students have not been in school in March. And again, safety, safety, safety is first. So I don't want anyone to run off and, and on uh, social media and say, well, he's not valuing our lives and not being safe. Yes, that is the premise of what we start with. We start with Maslow before Bloom. So safety first. Um, Again, uh, what, let's look at the academic loss. Let's ensure that we're providing, and we've heard from thousands of community members, what are we doing to address the mental health needs of our students and staff? Again, you'll continue to have town halls throughout this year addressing those needs. So the academic part, yeah, that's, that, that's important as well, but uh, ensuring safety and addressing the mental health needs and, and the other positive benefits of getting our kids and our families back into school, back into normalcy. So I wonder if you would be amenable to putting in some placeholder data points sure. in this dashboard. Absolutely. And it could be as simple as X percent of elementary staff positivity rate or X percent of student ele or elementary students positivity rate. You know, just something that gives us a, a placeholder to say to be determined because you're absolutely sure. right. We don't absolutely. have the data. Yes. We can monitor the data in the next couple of weeks and kind of help us fill in the blank. Yeah. But it might, I, and I'm wondering, I'm looking at Director Hansen just to see if that would be helpful if we at least approve this with some placeholders um, so we can make those differentiated decisions or we can see how those differentiated decisions will be made. Would that be helpful for you? I do think it's helpful. And I understand that we have an enormous district and it's really hard to find a one size fits all solution. I just am not sure that I'm completely clear on why we have gone to the extensive effort to put together this very detailed dashboard only to say that even though we are technically in the yellow zone and should be hybrid learning, that we may be willing to consider looking at in-person learning because of some other factors. I just, I'm really struggling with, with why we would would try to create a dashboard that has such clear criteria only to try to add and create abstract um, abstract aspects of it. Understood. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and I and I think that's the thing that Dr. Tucker's trying to move move us away from is the rigidity Correct. of this tool because I think that's where we get ourselves into problem when we say, okay, we're at 25 right. to 100,000, let's open up, right. when there's other factors we have to consider. And I think not only is it this dashboard that he's proposing, it's, it's, it's multi-dimensional uh, approach. It's, it's all the other metrics that Correct. Mr. Sethi showed that's behind this dashboard that's being taken into consideration as well, which is what I like, is that it isn't just a very simple decision. It, it's still complex. There's still a lot of factors that have to be considered. So I get the need to have black and white, but I think we're hearing tonight it can't be. And um, we're also hearing though that we're gonna be very thoughtful in making the decision uh, that we make. And that if a community sees the complexities of all the things we're gonna consider, 
I would think that would be reassurance as opposed to thinking, oh my gosh, you guys are still in the yellow zone and you haven't done anything yet. Well, there's other factors that we have to consider. So that's just kind of where I'm at with this. And I understand Director Hansen, the, the struggle as well. Director Meek, and then Director Holtzman. So Director Hansen, I'm wondering, that's where I think the complexity of this is a little confusing in that you might be rated number one for safer at home, but you're zero for positivity, zero for incidents, zero for hospitalizations. And when you add all of those up, you end up in green. You're not in yellow. But I think it's hard to understand this, the way it's being displayed, if that makes sense. Yes. Director Holtzman, go ahead. So I would agree with Director Meek, but I'm trying to find solutions and I'm not sure that I have any. Um, the only thing I could think that might be helpful is under each of them, like under the numbers, it says DCSD will also look at, and it names off hospitalizations, deaths, state metrics. We could also put our local Douglas County School District um, data or metrics. Um, and for me, that, that that includes, and I've already said that, but it includes more than just the positivity or, you know, the quarantine. It also includes if we're physically able, practically able to continue um, with all the safety measures that we have in place. And I know we will do it. I'm 100% confident we have the will to do it. But, you know, if we can't get supplies, that's a problem. If we have broken ventilation, that's a problem. So for me, all of that Douglas County School District specific could just be put up there and that we would know that it's being considered. Um, I don't know if maybe taking the zero, one, and two would help if we took that away. I, I don't know. But I do, I do understand that somebody could look at it and, and think it's hard and fast, black and white, and that's certainly not what it is. And I appreciate it. I think it's really good work, and I, I really appreciate what you've done. And I think I was trying to figure out a recommendation, and I think it is maybe just having a number that's next to each of the criteria so it doesn't feel like it's always one or always zero. We actually, yeah. this is the screen. Uh, Mr. Sethi, would you walk our folks through this again? So as you we were talking originally, there's, there's the numbers which are with each of the tri-county criteria, and it ultimately needs to sum up. The missing part of the equation is going to be our local data. We just need to stabilize that. As Dr. Tucker was saying, watch it for the next two weeks. We'll also start getting data from Gary community, which is going to be a big one uh, from a data set perspective. We'll have employees. We'll know where they are, locations, and stuff like that. So. <clears throat> The opportunity to stabilize and kind of map this out is just there. And you can see the framework. Where as soon as we start getting some real data on those points, we could norm it and put it out. But we do have, so these individual data points exist for each of those numbers, 0, 1, 2, as you can see. And the scales are at the bottom of that. And zero is the score that you really want. You want a low score, you don't want a high score. We received a one on the 14 day incident rate, again, because we're beyond that 25 cases per 100,000. As I said, that's one of the reasons why when you look at the uh, state's uh, attempt and the county's attempt for protect our neighbor, and then, as David pointed out again, Director Ray, excuse me, pointed out again, um, it's uh, one of the challenges of trying to reach that number and have a positivity rate uh, below 5%. So uh, the, all those numbers would be zero if we did not uh, go beyond 25 cases per 100,000 when you look at the incident rates. Uh, Mr. Sethi, can you flip to some other variables? And we will be assigning numbers uh, to those uh, other risk uh, or key data points as well, uh, really focusing 
on the uh, staff school data points. I know that was mentioned. Can we break it out by schools and uh, break it out by staff? So th that's, uh, that's coming. So directors, I'm gonna make a suggestion. I, I see your hand, Director Lung, too, but it, it sounds like we're at consensus that we're, we're headed in the right direction with having this multi-dimensional approach to this decision-making framework. Um, certainly here that we still have some other unknowns like the Metro Partnership for Health is coming in with maybe another dashboard. And, and so I'm, I'm wondering, directors, given the hour, if, if instead of us trying to push ourselves to approve something, uh, let's just uh, affirm our superintendent that he's definitely going in the right direction in terms of getting more clarity in terms of how these decisions are made and that we will continue to massage it um, at our next meeting uh, as opposed to making a formal approval. I don't, I don't know, it doesn't feel like we're ready for formal approval yet because we well, wanna see some layout changes. Directly. Well, well, I guess what I would say is this, is I think um, it's gonna be, in my view, next to impossible to just keep looking at all the different data points we might or might not wanna include. Um, and then come up with a number that's presented without any supporting qualitative data that's gonna matter. I mean, you have to have some kind of blend here of like a number that takes into effect, account a lot of different things, but also has some level of conversation and again, f what I would call feel around it. Um, I think combining the two, which is what's being presented, I think that's what I'm hearing is that we have a I see a strong mix of a lot of data up there that can get us to a number that makes people comfortable or gives you some idea, but then also discussion points that are gonna matter. I think that's being presented and there's thoroughness to it. So from my standpoint, I, I'm, a, I'm good with this. We can look at minor modifications we've suggested, but I don't, I don't wanna keep coming back to this week after week and then saying, well, may, what about this particular point, data point that we didn't think about? I think at some point we have to just trust. Again, I think the staff has done a lot of work to come up with this. So I, I, I don't know what other, uh, we can keep looking at different data points of, uh, of uh, different points, but I think that's just gonna prolong this before just making a decision on it. So. Very good. So I'm gonna hear from Director Long and then directors are gonna push us to make some action. So you, either it's tabling for it to be continue to be modified, or it could be a motion that Director Graziano is saying is this is the best we're going to get right now. Let's go with it. So Director Long, comment, and then Board Directors, a some action. Well, I really appreciate you know in the in the July twenty fifth meetings, we act the component of having the principal and and our staff give us what do they think, and when I'm looking at the data point, we are only looking at the data, but we did not take into the factor of the principal's point of view. Are we ready from their point of view? Um, on July 25th, a large, um, I mean, I mean, my decisions is, I mean, large part, you know, based on, you know, my principal's recommendations, um, and, and I would love to also add a component that consider our staff, you know, feedback, especially the building leader, because they are the one. I mean, we have seventy district school. Okay, um, whether this district school, some may be ready and some maybe not. So, in order to have one size fit all, based on just this six data point, without taking considerations of the real situations on the ground, yeah. I'm just not. I, I just would like, you know, to treasure the expertise and, um, and, and, and the feedback, you know, from them and, and trying to act this as a factor yeah. to consider. Yeah. And Director Long, I really ap appreciate that, but I don't want you or anyone here to leave to think that we've not gotten administrative feedback. We've not gotten principal feedback. We brought uh, six of our great leaders in here on the 25th. We meet online. Uh, Mr. Knight and other cabinet members constantly meet with our administrators to get their feedback and their feel. And, and quite frankly and quite respectfully, I think we're at a point of exhaustion. 
And at some point in time, we're going to have to make a decision to get our kids back in school and get them back in school safely because we can continue to admire this problem. We can continue to admire this virus, but it's going to come down to some point in time making the decision. And I appreciate your passion. I appreciate the board's uh, desire to get everyone involved. We've had a survey where we sent out an 85% of the, I don't know, 20 or 30,000 folks, I'm losing track of numbers, have said where they want to be. We've met with students. We've met with everybody in the district. And we've heard from Dr. Douglas say there's not a single dadgum district that he's worked with that has had more engagement than the Douglas County School District. So we're really at a point of saturation. All right, directors, I'm going to ask for a motion right now. So your motion can either be to accept the conceptually the decision-making framework that we've been presented tonight. It can be a motion to postpone approval till certain things are included in the dashboard. Um, so I'm just gonna ask for a motion at this time. Director Holtzman. Um, I'd like to make a motion to conceptually, uh, to approve the conception of this dashboard, or I, I'm, I think I maybe got the words backwards, but um, I just really appreciate um, the work that's gone into this. Um, it's been really important to us to look at the data, and this looks at the data. And it's not even looking at data prematurely. I think this is as close as it could get because we've acknowledged that we have a couple weeks of student data and staff data, but we just don't have enough to see the trends and, and, and decide that. And so I just feel like this is really um, going in the way that we've wanted it to go from the beginning. And it, it, it looks at the things that need to be looked at to keep our students and our staff safe. So I'm, I'm happy to make the motion to approve this framework. So the motion has been made to, uh, to approve the conceptual framework for decision making. Is there a second? I second. All right, further discussion? Director Hansen? Which was being implemented within the district, correct? It's not part of this motion. Um, so no, that's not correct. Um, and certainly we heard Dr. Tucker's commitment to keeping the board informed in terms of the decision-making process. But this um, decision that we're making tonight is strictly as Director Holtzman motioned, and that is to accept the conceptual framework for decision-making. It does not include who has the authorization to pivot to one learning model to the other, just to clarify. Any further discussion? So, I'm sorry, go ahead, Director Hansen. So who has the ultimate authority to pivot if we approve this conceptual framework? Uh, as all, our number one, our employee, our sole employee is the decision making, the, the decision maker of the operational part of the organization. So our superintendent would be making that decision. Okay, thank you. All right, any further discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. Director Graziano. Aye. Director Hansen. No. Director Holtzman. Aye. Director Lung. No. Director Meek. So as a conceptual framework, it will continue to evolve and we're in an environment where things will change daily. Um, and knowing that, um, I'll vote aye. And Director Ray is an aye as well, so that motion passes four to two. All right, we'll look forward. Dr. Kataska, finally, I'm sure, um, is a quick update regarding the 2020-21 budget. Dude. And then also important to point out here that um, Nutrition Services, while it's an enterprise fund and should normally be self-sustaining, they are anticipating approximately a $9.4 million loss of revenue if we were to stay in that hybrid format all year long. They are continuing to push meals and find creative ways to get out to students and families and then serve meals, but it's just the sheer reality of not having students coming through the lunch line in the volume that they typically do on a daily basis. So again, while that fund should be self-sustaining, it is possible that we could have to alleviate or provide some support from the general fund uh, in order to maintain some of that staff and ensure that we can provide those services. 
On the expenditure side, um, we're starting to look into areas of savings. Again, if we were to stay hybrid all year, right now we've estimated about 1.9 million in savings, largely due to transportation, unfortunately, knowing that we're not running those bus routes on Fridays at this point. Um, and we've also committed to maintaining benefit eligibility through at least first semester. So while we could realize about two million in savings, that commitment to maintaining benefit eligibility will, will prevent us from fully realizing some of that savings. Keep reiterating that our CARES fund or the CRF funding ends in December 2020. We'll go through some of the spending and updates there. But absent any additional relief funding, uh, anything that extends into that second half of the year would need to be paid for by general fund dollars. So this next slide is what you've seen before with just one small edit. Um, I did want to call out very specifically on the CRF spending uh, through July 31st that that educational materials line does include the half cost for Edgenuity so that we can be really transparent about um, that as, as half of the funding source for uh, Edgenuity. On the next slide takes us from July, 20, July 31st, excuse me, through August 14th. So you can see that our remaining balance has come down pretty significantly. These are not all purchases that have fully flowed through the system. Many, many, many of these are committed funds that we know we have approved either through the committee who's been meeting to review and approve and prioritize requests. Um, the earmarking of funds for our high free and reduced lunch schools, we're still working with those schools to gather their requests. So like I said, much of this is, is commitments. It's not actual expenditures that have 100% flowed through, through the system. The biggest item here, and I talked a lot about in our last couple of board meetings, is that um, need for personnel expense. So right now we're estimating about $8.1 million for half of the year in order to cover um, both staff that would be teaching 100% e-learning, those staff that are backfilling into our hybrid model schools, um, overlap and potentially teachers taking on additional sections or classes, additional EA support, substitute support, um, all of those different personnel components needed to uh, be able to run both of those programs. Again, this is for half of the year. So anything that we would need to continue on through the second half of the year um, would likely need to come from the general fund. Now my biggest focus, sorry, got to go back. Uh, my biggest focus has been on a couple of areas in terms of that $9.3 million that we have remaining. One is to get some as accurate as of estimates as we possibly can related to how much PPE we need to, serve, to, to sustain us through the end of the year. Those one-time sort of consumable materials, making sure that we have enough set aside there. And then looking at mechanisms through within the guidelines of the grant to allow us to extend beyond December 31st. And so what that means is looking at the gap in instructional time or the, the increase in instructional time that we're experiencing now in the fall versus what we had in the spring and able to um, recoup some of those costs related to that increase of instructional time. I'll have more to present on that during our next board meeting. I really wanna make sure I'm working out the mechanics of that and make sure uh, Ms. Schleissner isn't um, kicking me under the table from my, uh, the accounting perspective. Um, so, so that's what I've been working on is, is one, to make sure we have the appropriate reserve to get us through the rest of the year, fielding the remaining of requests that we have coming in. We certainly still have you know, some of those um, individual uh, sites or departments uh, requesting funds as well as that appropriate supply of PPE and things that we'll need to get us through the end of the year. But first and foremost, looking at that mechanism to extend the runway of this funding to, to really insulate our general fund um, from, from those costs. So quick update, um, at our last meeting we earmarked approximately 736,000 for our schools of highest need. So those above 10% free and reduced price lunch. A request form went out um, on August 6th and much of those, uh, we've been working very closely with principals to understand the requests, to you know, really just fast track all of those approvals. As long as they're within the guidelines of the grant, it's been an all systems go pushing that out. We've approved about 200,000 to date, but that form is not technically due until the 21st. Um, and we are prepared to extend that if our principals feel like they need just a little bit of time having, you know, knowing that they're trying to get schools up and running and, and maybe this isn't top priority right now, um, but certainly can extend that deadline if we need to. Um, the other side of our relief funding is ESSER funds. This has not really changed much since we last spoke. 
Um, we're still sitting at about 336,000 remaining. Again, I've called out really specifically that we've got the other half of Edgenuity within that educational materials line. Um, and, and again, if, if we don't have additional relief funding or we can't find some of those mechanisms to extend the bigger bucket, this is all we have left. So really just trying to keep tabs on it and make sure that we've got that full plan before committing those funds um, to be used. Um, not quite related to um, um, spending and, and uh, relief funding, but I wanted to give you a quick update on furlough days. Uh, we've been working really closely with our department leads, DOS, um, to identify and calendar the furlough days that staff would take. Our first goal was to align with any non-student contact days wherever we possibly could. We also worked to make sure that we had secondary options for some of our employee groups to make sure that we had appropriate coverage. So that me and Ms. Schleisner aren't out on the same day or me and Ms. Doan when she's back from leave aren't out on the same day. So giving that as a flexible option um, within you know, specific groups to, to choose an A or B schedule. Important reminder, uh, and this was dated in a board memo in June, we are directing employees not to work. So it is very, very important that when they are taking their furlough days, they are not to be responding to text, to emails, to anything that would constitute work or they would need to be compensated um, for the work that they're doing. We did hold a staff town hall, myself along with Amanda Thompson in HR um, on August 13th. We communicated this along with some other um, information, not just related to furloughs, uh, uh, furlough days, but accrual time off and things of that nature. Just some of the direct employee impacts um, related to these decisions. So on the next slide is that calendar of proposed furlough days. Again, our goal here is that we are calendaring as much as possible, that we don't have to leave it to folks to self-select and remember to do that every time they come, as much as we can plug these into Workday. Um, I'm working with staff to, um, on the mechanism to select which option, A or B, you'd like to take. And then there are some groups that we just, we know, we know we need to be flexible. Construction is an example. Much of their work happens when school is out of session. They don't know if something will come up and a project is delayed or maybe fast-tracked and they need to select a different day. So we, we have the ability to be flexible there. Um, our goal, again, just to identify as many as we possibly could to take that burden off of staff in, in having to self-report. So that's all I've got for tonight. Uh, happy to answer any questions that you have. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Kataska, for that update. Um, one quick question I have back on the slide regarding nutrition services. So they don't have reserves that they can dip into for that additional loss that they're anticipating? They do, but certainly not in that amount. Okay, okay. Do you approximately? Uh, I don't want to speak directly. I'm okay. sorry, I don't know it off the top of my That's head. Fine. <laughs> and is, is there a problem when, they, when you have an enterprise service like nutrition services that are supposed to be self-funded? Is there an issue with them? Uh, I don't want to say bailed out, that's, a, that's a, a bad word, but is there an issue with general fund transfers to an enterprise program? Um, no, it would certainly have to be appropriated as part of our amended budget if we were going to do that, okay. uh, but it's what's called an interfund transfer and that's certainly allowable. Very good. All right, directors, any questions for Ms. Kataska? Director Meek? So I know we're living in a very fluid time right now and I'm trying to understand student count day and what happens if after student count day, we see students wanting to come back into the district. So our count takes place in October. That is the mechanism through which the state will update our funding uh, as a district. So you are absolutely right that it could, could be the case that come October, we adjust our count down um, and then students decide to come back. Um, as of right now, um, that, that is the mechanism on which school finance works. Um, in other states that I've worked with, or um, uh, really just other states, uh, there's a couple different ways that states can choose to do their count. They can do multiple count days, they can do a single count day or a count window like we do, or they could do a uh, average daily membership or average daily attendance. It's really important as states are choosing to flip or change between one of those methods to understand if that is a mechanism to reduce funding. So in most cases, if you look at an average daily attendance or an average daily membership, that count is gonna be lower on, than on any given day. So um, October is generally the place where you have peak enrollment. 
Um, so again, in general, when we see states moving towards an average daily membership, it's a mechanism to say, I'm gonna keep that per pupil rate the same, but I'm going to fund less students, thereby, thereby um, you know, giving us a budget reduction scenario. So again, as of right now, our, our method is um, an October count, a single true up. We would adjust school budgets accordingly for, school, uh, for students that are truly moving out of district. There is no plan right now to adjust SBBs for students that might be choosing the 100% e-learning. But if I have an enrollment population within my building that has chosen homeschool, chosen a charter, chosen a completely non-Douglas County option, budgets will need to be reduced. And I, I credit um, Ted and his team as they've been working through that staffing scenario, really looking to schools that might be really significantly impacted by an enrollment decline and starting those conversations early about how they might um, adjust their budgets to support the e-learning model. So as a board, I'd like to encourage us to think about advocacy in this area and how we might work with the state legislature in um, looking at this. Schools being essential services, we serve the students that come in. And so I think that's something for a future board meeting perhaps for us to talk about. Um, Ms. Kataski, I know the CRF funds allow for professional development days in lieu of furlough days. And I'd like to understand um, how the committee would evaluate that as an opportunity. It seems that we are starting up school and we are you know, doing hybrid learning yeah. with online remote, um, the mental health needs of our students and our staff and identifying whether it's a good use of these resources yeah. to pay furlough days for training. So it's really important that we don't call it paying for furlough days. Um, it's not as simple as just a swap, that we had to reduce two days from the schedule and we can bring those back um, through the CRF funds. It has to be in the form of professional development that is completely dedicated to COVID-19 related topics, whether it's mental health, um, online learning, certainly some of our, our professional development that we've already had qualifies for that. Um, and it's something that the committee still has as a sort of tickler file to, to review as, as one of their final items. We could go back and, and stipend or retro pay for days that have already occurred. We're also working to get um, the agendas from those PD days and, and make sure that all of that time, all the full eight hours, constitutes as, as COVID related. But we could also do it moving forward if we wanted to, correct? Yeah. Again, so as long as could, it met that stipulation right. of 100% um, um, COVID related and didn't occur after December 31st. Or training towards complying with public health orders. So mm -hmm. they are, they're really yeah. specific, but yeah. it seems like we'll know in a week or two maybe what the needs are yep. in the system. So thank you. Those uh, 1,250 students, uh, Ms. Kataska, do we know, is that majority of those students go to charters, private, homeschool? Do we have any idea how that breaks out? The where they go is a little bit tougher to track until we get some of those final counts. Um, I can tell you that it's about 95% in our elementary schools where the decline is coming from, and then about 1% in our secondary schools, and then our charters are down about 1% as well. Okay. So a small uptick in, I think, um, our, our alternative schools, if I'm remembering correctly, but minimal compared to the, the, the decline in elementaries. If, um, if we find that um, a lot of that percentage of kids have gone to charters because of the five days in person, okay. and then we, after Labor Day, are able to go to in person and, we, and families say, okay, I'm gonna come back mm -hmm. now. I'm wondering, uh, and this might be a question for Ted, because I know he did a lot of work the last couple of years around open enrollment, but have we, are we in a position where we can welcome with open arms some of these kids back um, who maybe have left us because of the learning model that we've chosen? Say, so, man, I hope so, but I will defer to uh, Mr. Knight in terms of the feasibility. All right, thank you. Thank you for the, the question, President Ray. So, the open enrollment process is closed, but we still have the admin transfer process. Um, and as long as it's before the October count that you were discussing earlier and consistent with state law, if a student wants to come back to their home neighborhood school, we would support that. Very good. So administrative transfer really does, you feel like, Mr. Knight, that that really does provide us a mechanism to allow for that group of kids to come back. Uh, you don't anticipate any 
any loopholes there as far as, I mean, I, I just want to make sure our policies are up to speed as far as how that um, administrative transfer works. Because I know at one time it was both principals had to decide, uh, otherwise a child wasn't allowed to move and, and things like that. So I'm just wondering if we need to do any work there. So We could ask um, Ms. Clemish, but my understanding would be the the state law of being able to go back to your neighborhood school would override that if that occasion did occur. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for Ms. Kataska, Director Long? Well, thank you for the update. Um, knowing that the PPP money, you know, is gone, and um, the $600 unemployment benefits additional benefits is gone. Um, how would that affecting our next uh, budget update? Is this in September? Um, do the board need to consider that would probably adversely affecting um, our state's economy, knowing that these two main components, um, stimulated money is no longer there as of today? Um, and the second question is, the care funding that ends at December 2020, is, is it a con congressional um, mandate law or is it a pres presidential directive? Um, could, so does it take an act of Congress to change the end day or does it take a, the president's directive to change you know, the, the end day? I believe, and I will correct myself uh, at a later date if I'm wrong, uh, it was the governor's decision to allocate CRF in the way that he did to schools. So it's a state level decision in terms of how that grant was allocated for the CRF bucket. ESSER is the longer term and then that would have to be um, uh, at a federal level. Director Meek. So I just wanna understand there's 8 million in personnel costs and we're down 1,200 mm -hmm. students. So I'm just trying to understand um, how the math works there. Can you speak to that? I'm gonna invite Mr. Knight up to talk about sort of that, that shuffling of staff and the staffing of both our 100% e-learning and the work that went into um, making those assignments. That's a, a long answer. So, so a lot of work by, uh, by Ms. Smith and by our directors of schools and a lot of collaboration with principals and teachers. But um, basically, as, as Ms. Kataska said, looking at some of those schools that had uh, declining enrollment that might possibly have to cut staff come true up, along with um, collaboration with HR on on ADA accommodations and, and who wanted to teach remotely and just working through those one by one and figuring out what teachers wanted to teach what and what teachers were certified to teach what. Um, and it's one reason why we had to wait till the end. We had to see what kids at what grade levels from what regions wanted to come in. Um, and I think it's been characterized as a puzzle um, several times. So it was kind of just putting that puzzle together. Does that get at all at the question? I wanna make sure I'm not missing the crux of it. No, I think so. I'm just trying to think, are we, so even the, new, the, the enterprise fund, um, are there ways not to spend the money if we, I guess I'm just trying to figure out if we are, if there are ways to cut, to save money right now in order to um, help us moving forward for the remainder of the year. Um, so I'll say two things. Um, on the enterprise fund, while their projected revenue could decline 9.4 million, because they're largely self-sustaining, it's not as though that that is an immediate um, backfill in full from the general fund. They have already been working really hard and, and having some really tough conversations in terms of hours and employees and FTEs and staff and where they need them. Part of the thing that we're also trying to protect ourselves from is if we should pivot back to 100% in person, we need staff to be able to man the buildings to be able to support the kids as they're back in school full time. 
So we don't want to completely delete, you know, deplete all of our, our staffing resources, knowing that this could, could pivot back and could pivot back soon. Um, so that's some of the backfill that might occur after, you know, if they've used their reserves and, and if they've tapped into their other sources and revenue did come in where they're, they're thinking it would, um, it wouldn't be a 100% backfill. Some of that is similar on some of our general fund um, departments as well. Um, transportation has, has taken, you know, a lot of a, a lot of that brunt. But again, if, as, as we're even contemplating at some point in the future being back in person 100%, we have to make sure we can recover uh, and get folks back to where they need to be in order to support kids. So while yes, there could be cuts, some of those are just they're, they're things that we're not willing to do right now. Um, and, and, and don't feel like it's the right decision. And so that's where we've made those commitments through first semester so that we can reevaluate. And I'll just share one additional bit of information. So in instances where there have been reductions of hours or um, other positions that happened from the springtime, we're encouraging those individuals to consider in terms of that backfilling, supporting as an EA. Um, if they are able and, and uh, feel comfortable to do so, and or serving as a substitute, as we know, we can never have enough subs. So we're really trying to, as um, Mr. Knight said, work on that very intricate puzzle of staffing and trying to be as smart as possible in terms of opportunities for individuals within our system currently. So thank you for walking through that, because I think it's kind of confusing. It really helps to hear that you have to be able to ramp up and ramp down. I mean, really, the hybrid model requires such flexibility. And like in my mind, I'm thinking about the financial sustainability of that model going longer than our first half of the year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Do we, do we anticipate a relief on the way for the second semester? Or, I mean, is there any rumblings that we might see that happen? Um, there are rumblings, um, but I've always been told don't count your chickens until they're hatched. No, yes, <laughs> fair enough. All right. All right, this is an information-only item board. Ms. Kataska, again, thank you for uh, your information and thorough presentation. We're going to move on now, board, to the policy revisions that are on our agenda. First one is a second reading of board file ICICA school year school district calendar instructional time. Uh, this is a second reading. There are no additional revisions from our first reading. This is the policy that uh, not only references engagement, learning engagement, but it also uh, gives us the ability to count attendance for those students that are in a remote learning uh, situation. Mrs. Clemish, anything you wanted to add to that quick summary? No, nothing to add, and there have been no recommended revisions since the first reading. All right, so with that, I will entertain a motion to adopt ICICA. So moved. Mo motioned by Meek, seconded by Holtzman. Any further discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. Craziano? Aye. Hanson? Aye. Uh, thank you, Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray, aye. That passes unanimously. The next uh, revision is KI visitors, visitors to the school. And as we discussed in our work session, um, or at least had some interaction with Ms. Klimish regarding uh, this policy, basically just gives more specificity about why visitors may not be allowed at the building, especially around the issue of health and safety and efficiency of school operations. Mrs. Clemish, anything you wanted to add to that? Nothing further. All right. Motion to approve the revisions for KI visitors to the schools. So moved. Second. Moved by Holtzman, seconded by Meek. Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, let's go. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray, aye. That passes unanimously. Next is um, Board of Foul GBAA, sexual harassment under Title IX and other prohibited misconduct of a sexual nature. Uh, again, this is a personnel policy that aligns with all the other policies that our legal counsel and legal team have been working on to keep us in compliance with Title IX. Uh, Mrs. Clemish, any additional comments? 
Uh, no additional comments. Um, I, again, this policy is consistent with JBA and JBC applicable to students. This one is applicable to our employees and addresses and defines conduct which is in violation of Title IX is applicable to them. Very good, thank you. Motion, um, uh, question, Director Lung? My question is, does this cover contractor for the um, district? This policy uh, protects any individual who is impacted by their level of participation in the programs of the district. It would be my sense that if a contractor was working for the district, it would be the obligation of their employer under Title VII to protect them from sexual harassment unless the contractor was itself or its employees were participating in the educational programs of the district. Title IX only applies to educational programs provided by the district and it protects participants in those programs or who are participating in those programs. Typically contractors, depending upon the nature of what they're doing, may or may not be impacted by Title IX. It would be the responsibility of the Title IX coordinator early on if a complaint came in to make a determination as to whether or not jurisdiction of Title IX or whether Title IX was applicable to the particular individual impacted and whether the conduct was uh, protected by Title IX. Very good. Motion to approve file GBAA. So moved. Second. Moved by Holtzman, seconded by Graziano. Any further discussion? Seeing none, a spoke, Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Bray, aye. That passes unanimously. Next is board file JICCR2, student conduct on school buses. We again had a discussion with Mrs. Clemish regarding this, but specifically gives our uh, bus drivers and transportations a means to enforce uh, students wearing protective equipment such as face masks um, and also outlines some disciplinary action that can be taken as well. Um, Mrs. Clemish, any additional comments about these revisions? Nothing further to add. Thank you. Motion to approve student conduct on school buses. Motion the revisions. Approve. Sorry. Director Long has made a motion to approve the revisions for JICCR2. Second. Seconded by Graziano. Any further discussion? Let's vote. Graziano? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Holtzman? Aye. Long? Aye. Meek? Aye. Ray? Aye. That passes unanimously. File GBAB or policy GBAB is titled Workplace Health and Safety uh, Protection. This is a new policy uh, that has been recommended uh, to us through not only our CASB organization, but also through uh, our legal counsel and our cabinet. Um, Mrs. Clemish, would you like to just capture the essence of this policy? Yeah, the essence of this policy is really to provide an avenue of protection to employees within the district to assure that they're comfortable in knowing that they can uh, bring forth concerns related to their protection in the workplace, their feeling of working in a safe work environment. And that if they don't, they can take their concerns forward to a workplace coordinator without concern for retaliation for engaging in that kind of reporting uh, with respect to their concerns. Additionally, it prohibits discrimination uh, against employees, in addition to retaliation, who raise any kind of reasonable concern uh, with respect to allegations involving workplace violations of government health or safety rules. So this was a statute that was passed in Colorado recently, and this policy is drafted to consistently uh, align to the requirements of that statute. Very good, thank you, Mrs. Clemish. And certainly this is a first reading board, so there's not action required, but are there other further questions or discussion? And I would just again, um, as I stated earlier at our work session, really pleased to add this to our employee policies to reassure them, as Mrs. Clemish pointed out, that they are safe 
And number two, that if they feel unsafe, that there's a mechanism for them to get that resolved without feeling uh, threatened or that there would be retaliation. So I really believe this is a great policy for us as a board to adopt at this time, given the circumstances. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to approving it on its second reading. Other, though, other comments, uh, board directors, regarding this policy, this first reading? All right, so first reading has been completed and we'll look forward to that being on our next board meeting for um, approval of a second reading. Thank you, Mrs. Clemish, again, for all your hard work and navigating this and again, keeping us up to speed with uh, our policies. We appreciate that. You're welcome, thank you all. Next, uh, President and Vice President reports. Um, just quick, some quick reminders. We do actually have a date for a retreat after some fierce negotiation with a couple of board directors. Um, because I will tell you, all those dates that I gave out to you, not one of those dates worked for all seven of us to be together, um, if you can believe that. So just, I want you to feel my pain a little bit about when I try to find a date for you guys and us to, to come together. But we think, and Dr. Tucker, this is for you as well, September 19th is a Saturday that we're targeting as a date to have a full day work session with our superintendent uh, to do everything from reflection to goal setting to um, really maybe even getting back into the strategic plan. Wouldn't that be wonderful for us to start talking about student learning uh, again? So uh, all that is planned for the 19th of September at 8 to 4 uh, on Saturday. Also, Are we doing that? that's a good question. I don't know where the location is. Um, we'll have to really see kind of where we are with the, the social distancing and, and all that. But I, yeah, I had not thought of that, Director Graziano, so I will. I'll work on that with Mrs. Taylor and we can kind of figure out what a viable location might be. If, uh, would you guys prefer to go up back to the Outdoor Ed Center? Would you prefer to do it here um, in our boardroom? Anybody have quick, quick thoughts about location for that? What's that? Yeah, Director Graziano likes to be outside, so. Yeah, I was gonna say it has more space as well to yeah. spread out. Okay, so we can maybe start, Mrs. Taylor, maybe start pursuing with um, uh, our outdoor ed people of whether that might be possible, that's great. Agenda planning is this Friday at 10 o'clock. I will also just give you a heads up that um, the following agenda planning, we're moving to Thursday at nine o'clock on September 3rd, and that's the plan, the September 14th meeting. But this agenda coming up for September 1 is uh, at 10 o'clock uh, this Friday. Um, also, just a reminder that we should be at a place of bringing forth our priorities from our committees, the priority tasks that we want them to work on. So I would like to see that on our agenda uh, for September 1st, if possible, uh, to begin approving what their focus should be for the upcoming year. So again, you have those examples from last year that we worked on, and I think that's a good place to start with them to kind of see our, which of those are still important that we should carry over and whether there's some additional focus areas that we want our committees to work on. Um, that is it for me. Director Holtzman. Um, I just have a follow-up question on the retreat date because I know we'll start getting questions immediately. Um, for the last few years, at least, we've invited our committees to that retreat, um, or at least to some of our retreats. I guess it would be this one usually. Um, and I just have to say that as much as I love seeing them, we are going to be setting their goals, it sounds like, prior to that. Um, I just know that we've been putting off kind of some of the items on this retreat, and they've built up over time. And I, I guess I would advocate that we probably don't invite our committees this time. As, and like I said, it's kind of the highlight of the retreat, so I hate to say that, but um, I do want to give them notice because they'll be asking. So yeah, I just want to throw that out there. No, I, I, I would concur with you. Um, and I think that that's why I would encourage us, the liaisons, to do that work. I know that Director Lung and I have already done that work with student advisor group, and we've got a clear focus in terms of things they're going to work on. So yeah, I, I would have no problem with us just not having committees at that because I think we have a full agenda otherwise, unless other board directors feel differently. All right. All right, Director Holtzman, anything else to report? I don't think so. Okay, no. other directors, any other, any other information that's worthy of, of, our, of everybody hearing at this time? 
Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Motions, so move. Motion made. Second. Seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Have a great evening.